Some of the changes included the use of search warrants as a tool to gain entry for investigating, a dramatic increase in compliance rates, an increase in charges of over 800%. The courts are beginning to recognize our work and more appropriate fines are being levied as a general deterrent. So I'd now like to call on the uh, fo following, I'd like to call forward the following officers and their supervisors for a swearing in ceremony. And as I call your names, if you just come up here behind me, and we'll arrange for the swearing in ceremonies. The first is Officer Sean Keto. The next is Officer Ryan. Paulus. Next is Officer Sean McLeod. The next is Officer John Bridgman. The next is Officer Kobe Constant. Next is Officer Jay Berberic. Next is Officer Chris Noakes. I tell you, it makes me a little uncomfortable, all these uniforms <laughs> standing behind me. <laughs> I know, well, that's okay. You know, as a teenager, we had a visit from these guys once in a while. And we also have with us uh, Superintendent Kim Coombs and uh, Superintendent Carmela, uh, Carmela Vedek. Fuck off, Carmela. Okay, so um, I'm going to do the swearing in. So if you'd open the books up, and I'll start you off, and then each of you in unison can read out the, uh, the swearing in uh, documents and just say your own name when you come to that part. So you ready? So I. I. Very good. So, thank you very much, and welcome aboard. Be careful, Sam. Okay, so Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, good morning, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of the committee. There are several changes again to the agenda this morning. There is an added delegation request from Christopher Cutler on behalf of the Canadian Peace Initiative Hamilton Chapter to present in support of the concept of a Canadian Department of Peace. This can be added as item 4.3. Item 6.1, which is a presentation uh, from the Canadian Ballet Youth Ensemble Board of Directors, 
has been uh, requested by the organization to be postponed to May 15th, so they will not be here to present this morning. And also there is an added notice of motion respecting the resolution re urging the federal government to establish a national department of peace. And this is um, in relative or, or deals with also the presentation that is before the committee this morning for consideration. Also there have been several um, handouts provided to the members of the committee for the various presentations that will be provided by staff and by the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. So I have a motion then to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Johnson, seconded by Partridge. All in favor? Carried. Declarations of interest. Members of the committee, are there any declarations <coughs> excuse me, of interest? Seeing none, members of the uh, committee, before proceeding with the business on the agenda, staff has requested that item 12.3 on the agenda respecting proposed settlement of OMB appeals of development charges be moved for dis uh, up for discussion following the public delegation. The reason for this request is Gary Scandlin from CN Watson Associates is only available to be here this morning and respond to questions of the committee. If the committee is agreeable to this request, I will uh, be asking for a motion to move into closed session following the two public delegations. And we'll move on to item three now, which is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Okay. This is both April 3rd and April 4th. To seconder, seconded by Pearson. All in favor? Carry. Members of the committee, uh, you have before you uh, three delegation requests. Uh, the first is from Maria Almond. Uh, before asking a motion on this request, uh, is, I see, think Tony Fallis is here. Ah, there he is. Um, I think we need to hear from Tony, uh, who is our manager of elections, because uh, he's had some discussions with the person who's applying for delegation status, and we would like to provide some information to the committee. So, Tony. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a reminder to uh, councillors that the, um, the selection of uh, polling locations is at the sole discretion of the city clerk. Uh, we have had meetings with uh, members of the McMaster University student body, and we are reviewing it as a polling location at this time. I would only caution that there be no recommendation for this, as it would be in, uh, in violation of the Municipal Elections Act. Okay, so we have two choices then, Tony. One is to receive the, or hear the delegation, but simply to receive it afterwards, uh, or the second is to refer the, uh, the applicant to the clerk who has the sole discretion to make this decision. Is that correct? That is true, Mr. Chair. Okay. So I have uh, Councillor McCaddy, then Councillor Partridge. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And, and Tony, have I talked about this previously because the McMaster Student Union had contacted me and obviously it's the Ward 1 Councillor who... Uh, uh, runs in that area, uh, McMaster area, I, I need to stay out of this uh, clearly, but I think there is value to, uh, in, a, in a public sense, uh, to, uh, to hearing the presentation and as you suggested, uh, taking no action uh, as a city council. So I would, I would support accepting the delegation on, on that basis. Okay, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you uh, to Tony. Uh, Tony, you mentioned that you had met with members, but did you uh, meet with Maria at all? Is she aware of the ongoing discussions? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, she is aware. Um, I tried to follow up with her two weeks ago, and she refused to speak to me. She refused to speak to you? That is correct. Wow. I, I met with the clerk's office wow. on this yesterday, and the Municipal Act is abundantly clear. We can't be seen as influencing elections. That's why it's 100% delegated to the clerk. And so part, as Councilor McCaddy says, we have democracy and we should hear from citizens, but we can do nothing on this because okay. we're, we're prohibited to under the Municipal Act. Councilor Park. Yes, and thank you. I still have the floor. I'm, I'm very troubled by that, that, um, that someone refused to meet with, with you, Tony. I mean, clearly the, uh, the purview of the elections and the locations is under the clerk's department and um, yourself as the representative. So I'm, I'm quite concerned about that. I'm just, I'm, I'm also concerned about the, <clears throat> the, the presentation today being more to lobby City Council, which, it, which we can't do that, Chair. I just, can you confirm that, please, Tony? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, she had written to me through an email uh, asking for clarification, and I had responded to her indicating what the uh, legislation is clear on and that we will be reviewing it and continuing to meet with members. Uh, I believe that that is the reason that she refused to speak to me again last week, one, uh, two weeks ago, once I was uh, made aware of the, um, of the uh, presentation she was going to give to Council. 
But it, it is lobbying and, and clearly you, you cannot lobby for a polling location um, because obviously you could have special interests for that particular polling location. Thank you. So uh, through you, Chair, I would appear that our position is pretty clear from what Tony has said. So okay. uh, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to Tony. Tony, um, only because I saw this for the first time in our agenda and I wasn't aware of an issue. So, Tony, there um, general questions, Mr. Deputy Mayor. There have been no polling stations in the past at either Mohawk or McMaster. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please. Mr. Trolls. Through you, Mr. Chair, in uh, 2006, we had uh, revision offices set up for two days at McMaster and at uh, Mohawk University, uh, at Mohawk College, my apologies. Um, and then we had a polling location at both locations uh, on election day. Through the revision office, we had uh, two uh, Mohawk students sign up through revision, and uh, to the best of my recollection, only one voted on election day. We had 16 McMaster students who signed up and only 10 voted on election day. So what we have done uh, since then, we did not have one in 2010 because we could not come to, uh, we didn't feel at that point in time that it warranted a polling location with two locations, Binkley and Dalewood, within the proximity of the university. And again, we have, uh, have mentioned to um, the staffing at the uh, university that we will, again, meet with them and try to come to a, uh, a resolution on this. But at the, this point in time, we have not come to a conclusion on any polling locations. So, con thanks, Tony. Continuing on my general questions, just for information, Mr. Certainly. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to Tony. Tony, does this uh, delegate represent both McMaster and Mohawk students? She's referenced both in her email, but she shows as name of organization just McMaster. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Mr. Paulus. Through you, Mr. Chair, I have not heard from Mohawk. In 2010, when I approached them, they were not interested in a polling location uh, because I thought if we were going to be fair with one, we were going to be the fair with the other one as well. So I'm not aware that Mohawk, uh, that, that she does represent Mohawk, but I could not say for certain whether or not. Okay. And so obviously, Tony, the general intent from what I take from this delegate is to try to, if possible, hypothetically, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, provide easier, an easier method or a greater opportunity for students at both institutions to be able to vote municipally. Is that the general intent of what you interpret, Tony, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, what I have garnered from uh, this individual previously is that they feel we're not uh, giving them the democratic right to vote, which is clearly not the case as there are polling locations within that area. I do want to make it clear that the polling location, if it were to happen, would be strictly for on-campus uh, students. Those off campus would be going to their regular polling location. We do of course have an issue because most of the students on campus in residence are first year students so many of them are not, have not attained the age of, of voting. So at this point again we're still trying to go through it with them. We're trying to coordinate or we'll be trying to coordinate with their political science classes to see if there is some way we can uh, we can work through this with them. Maybe have them poll, uh, work the polls as well. So it's not a dead issue but at this point in time uh, there is no polling location at McMaster. So lastly, uh, Tony, thank you for all that, Tony. Lastly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think you were giving us two options. Through you to Tony. Tony, what's your professional recommendation on this delegation request then, please? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would uh, recommend that it just be referred to the clerk's office and that further discussions be, uh, be continued with the, uh, the clerk's office at this time. And Fair enough, I accept that. And if that were not to come to fruition, I suppose democratically the delegate still has a reserving the right to come in if she yeah. wants to. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, thank you. And I appreciate Tony's input on this. Um, I, I certainly support leaving it in the hands of the clerk's department because there's nothing we can do. We can't change the legislative rules so that it's up to the clerk's department and what they do. Okay, Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So I think there's a larger issue here. When somebody asks for delegation status, uh, they want to speak to city council. Here they are in council chambers, uh, uh, but they're also speaking to the larger uh, city of Hamilton. Uh, uh, more than ever, our, uh, our deliberations are broadcast uh, through city angles and through the great work of Joey uh, Coleman. And of course, the media are often here uh, covering our work. So. Uh, I think it's important that we realize that they're not only speaking to us, 
uh, but they're speaking to the larger city of Hamilton, sharing their view on whatever topic it might be, uh, in this case, the, uh, the election uh, issue. So I, I, would, uh, I feel strongly that we should support the delegation. Uh, however, uh, in uh, Tony's uh, good advice, uh, not uh, deliberate uh, in any way. Uh, uh, maybe there's questions for clarification or something. I don't know. We'd have to hear what is said by the uh, delegate. Uh, but, but obviously, uh, not take any particular position. Uh, uh, maybe at that point would be, would be smart to refer the, the, the comments, whatever they are, or perhaps the document, whatever comes forward, to, to clerks and allow clerks to, uh, to run with it uh, after that, as they have been. Uh, but to turn down the delegation, I think, is uh, problematic. It's not about us, not just about us. It's about uh, the city of Hamilton hearing particular views, uh, from the media and others. So I would uh, support the uh, delegation at the appropriate time and, and move that. Okay. Well, I have no uh, further speakers. So do you want to make that motion then? Uh, you indicated to come back to you. So I'm back to you now for a motion. I would uh, support the delegation with, uh, with those provisos that I've uh, just outlined. Okay. Second to that motion. Seconded by Councilor Maruna. Further discussion? All in favor? Better have a clear show of hands on this one. I think it's going to be close. All in favor? Opposed? That carries, obviously. And very clear majority. Okay, the second request is from uh, Joy Coleman. And before asking for a motion on this request, I would advise the committee that staff are in the process of uh, preparing a report on the Alapis Registry issue to the Accountability and Transparency Subcommittee, which will be reporting to the General Issues Committee. Uh, the clerk is suggesting that we, uh, we should, uh, uh, Vice Mr. Coleman's request be approved and that he be invited to attend the appropriate GIC meeting when the Accountability and Transparency Subcommittee report will be presented. What's your wish? Moved by Jackson, seconded by Pearson. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That carries. The uh, final request is from uh, Christopher Cutler on behalf of the Canadian Peace Initiative Hamilton Chapter to present in support of the concept of Canadian Department of Peace. And uh, Councillor uh, McCaddy has a motion which he will be introducing this morning related to this uh, issue. So, committee, what is your pleasure? Councillor McCaddy. Uh, so, Mr. Uh Deputy Mayor, this is a, a notice of motion today. It'll stay as a notice of motion, and it'll be uh, moved at the next uh, GIC May 1st, uh, if I recall correctly, Carolyn. And the delegation would come uh, at that point on May 1st. Are you clarify. moving to approve the delegation then, Councillor? Yes. Okay, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Uh, consent items. Members of the committee, you have before you consent items 5-1 to 5-3 inclusive. Are there any items to which you wish to have uh, moved to the discussion agenda? Moved by Pearson, all three be approved. Second? Five, five, one to five, three, all three. Okay, do you want to move it to public discussion or just a question? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Collins. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Through you on five, one. On page uh, four of six, there's a uh, financing chart there. It gives the financial status of the public art program. And as I understand it, uh, traditionally our, our block al allotments for public art was in the $250,000 range. <clears throat> and as you can see from the um, one of the paragraphs there, that amount has whittled down to about 190 to 182 now for 2013. So when you start to look at the, um, the balance remaining to fund uncommitted projects, there's uh, $546,000 that are uncommitted at this point in time, which represents now with the current funding almost three plus years worth of, of um, of funds. So the question that I would have is uh, now that we have three years worth of funds banked and um, the, the term that's used here is uncommitted, what's the plan for 2014 and beyond? Does that mean that we start to, as we've done in prior years, we go a year or two without funding this program because they need to catch up to the capital budget process? What, what's the plan on a go forward basis? Anna? Through the chair, I'll just give a quick background. So 11 projects have been completed to date for a value of $590,246. Six projects are currently in pro progress with a completion date of 2014 with a value of $830,000. 14 projects have been identified with funding in place. These projects, the timelines on these projects are 2013 to 2015. 
By the end of 2015, there'll be a total of $169,000 approximately left remaining in the public art projects. 2015 onward, seven new projects have been identified with an estimated funding requirement of $1.3 million. Funding sources are to be determined. So we'll be looking back at 2015, back to our capital and start building it up again. So the plan, sorry, would be, to, we're skipping 2014 then as a, as a year where there's a submission for public art. No, we wouldn't be doing that because we, to be able to bring us up to 2015, would be looking at the capital, uh, the public art allocation for 2013, which we do have this year, 2014 and 2015, to cover the projects that I just spoke about. And if council would like us, I can send this all in an email that outlines every single project, identification of the project, the funding, and where the funding source is coming from. Brings us up to 2015. So I thought I heard you say, <laughs> Anna, through you, Mr. Chairman, then that um, when these projects are constructed through 2013 to 15, <clears throat> there'll be a remaining balance of $169,000. Did I hear that correctly? That's correct. <clears throat> so that represents almost a year's worth of funding. Almost. Yes. That means we're kind of a, we have a year's worth of money in the bank. So I'm, try, I'm trying to sort out yeah. the cash flow as it relates to what's in the bank, what's committed, what projects we have on the horizon. And it almost sounds like we're one year ahead of ourselves as it relates to funding. Am I mistaken with that? If we go to 2015 and we receive all the allocations through the capital, we will at the end of 2015 have approximately 169,000 left in the bank. However, 2015 onward, there are seven projects that have been identified with an estimated funding requirement of about 1.3 million. <coughs> okay, uh, I don't want to hold it up, but I, I would appreciate the email that Anna referenced then and maybe that'll help uh, me understand better the financial flow as it relates to the next uh, three to five years. I'll okay. be happy to provide and you'll, that. You'll look after that? Yes. Okay, so uh, it's been duly moved. Uh, can I get a second or an all three, then I'll come to Councillor Partridge. You second it, Councillor Partridge? Okay, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, within the report, my question uh, will be to Anna through you. Within the report, um, it, it covers off everything except the process of how we go about actually receiving requests for public art. So it talks about the process of selection, I get that, but um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering on the public consultation side of it, is it up to the uh, councillors to bring those projects forward? If you could just explain that to me through yeah. the chair. Certainly through the chair, there are three ways that we identify projects. The first one is through the public art master plan, which is um, approved by council and will be going through a um, review next year. The second one is it's identified in other uh, master plans or planning documents such as the Gore Park master plan. They would identify areas for public art. And the third way is um, we have a direction from council that is brought forward by a councillor for a specific project in their area. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering where, how, how does Flamborough fit into all of that? Morning, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've just finished, of course, the North Wentworth. And as we go forward with the Public Art Master Plan, we'll be looking at your discussions you've had with me about something in Central Waterdown and how that would fit into the Public Art Master Plan or if there's another capital project coming forward in that area. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate that because there is a great deal of interest in... Uh, in the arts and culture coming back to Waterdown and Flamborough. It's been absent for the last 10 years or more. So uh, the, the community is, is quite interested in having those discussions. So appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Mr. Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, sorry I arrived late at a meeting this morning. Um, Councillor Deval and I uh, talked about, you know, art takes many forms. And we talked about what's happening in Quebec and I met a number of constituents actually uh, last night. And they talked about what they experienced in other cities, um, and 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 it also it, it was a twofold. It, it, it dealt with uh, graffiti because where uh, these murals took place, uh, the graffiti just went away. When you talk to the councillors, it was a huge success. 
And these murals uh, were primarily, in, in Winnipeg, it was re representing the Inuit or the Métis history. In Quebec, it was reflecting uh, the history of Quebec. So you see uh, 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 murals painted with people in, that, in those times, in the 1800s, and the buildings looking out the window and so forth. So it looked like an, an active uh, mural. And when I talked to the, uh, the um, uh, counselor from uh, Quebec City, he had indicated that it was a, a target for graffiti, and ever since they got the artist commission to do that, there has been no issues whatsoever. And so I'm getting more and more people starting to notice what other cities are doing uh, to one, combat, combat um, graffiti, but two, to provide a real different dynamic and areas of concern. So I'm just wondering, um, how does that fit in this program? Because I guess that's getting to the finer details, but I'm concerned that um, there are areas that have synergies by one, um, dealing with the graffiti issue, at the same time providing uh, uh, opportunity for art, which to me would be a higher priority than uh, doing something completely on its own in art. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've got two mural projects uh, to address graffiti, graffiti issues going forward this year, one at Carter Park and a renewal of the existing mural on James Street South. We've also been in discussion with Phil Hermersky and the Graffiti Working Group about other graffiti prevention art issues around signal boxes and uh, other issues around the city. So it's an ongoing conversation we're having with different parts of public works around graffiti management. And I appreciate that. And the reason, I, Mr. Chair, I'm highlighting that is because, there's, as we know, there's, there's, there's only so many dollars that are available uh, uh, for these programs. And uh, when you weight them, uh, I would hope that something like that, uh, what I've just, we just talked about, that concept, uh, it, it's a two-fold uh, piece. It's not only providing uh, opportunity for local artists and, and demonstration of art, but it's also addressing another issue, that's the graffiti. And, and to me, that's more, what should be more weighted than some other areas. I mean, I'm not sure how you would weight it, but I only, I only want to ensure that uh, with the very little dollars that are available, that there is some priority given to that. Through you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll definitely be looking at that in terms of the public art master plan and how we move forward and how we balance that out and other funding opportunities for those pieces. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so I see no other speakers, so a motion to uh, approve all three uh, consent items. All in favor? Carried. Opposed? That carries. So members of the committee, as previously advised, the delegation on behalf of the Canadian Ballet Youth Assemble has been postponed at the request of the organization. So we'll move on to 6.2. So members of the committee, I would now call on Commodore Russell Perry from the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club to uh, approach the podium and provide his presentation. Russ, you have five minutes, and if you get right up from the microphone, that would be great. I'll make it four and a half. Okay. Are the boats going in the water yet? Um, well, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we had a problem with a big storm on Thursday. We uh, now don't have 20 slips badly damaged and about 80 unavailable for use at the moment. And yes, boats are trying to go in. <laughs> that, that, that storm did a lot of damage to our city. It did. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, councillors, uh, city staff, guests and visitors. Um, my name is Russ Perry. I'm actually the past commodore, the immediate past commodore of the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. And thank you very much for allowing me to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to talk to you this morning about the proposed agreement between the city and the Hamilton Port Authority. I've also got to say special thanks to uh, Aldor, uh, Darlene Cole, Chris Phillips, uh, Mayor Bob Bertina, um, Councillors Jason Farr, uh, city staff, and other members of city council who've worked with us over these many months to uh, understand better what the RHYC position is moving forward. I should also say thank you to Carolyn who has moved this thing diligently for us for the last four months. Thank you, Carolyn. How do I move this?
over there. Okay. Um, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is very pleased with the city that they're moving ahead uh, with the setting sail initiatives. I think you will agree, especially after the storm uh, that I just mentioned uh, last week, this is a welcome initiative, uh, truly. And we're really most pleased that the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is going to be part of this plan. Um, the main reason I'm here today is to emphasize our support of the city's plan and what the Royal Hampton Yacht Club does for our community. We have been assured that any agreement uh, between the city and the Hampton Port Authority does not limit the uh, Yacht Club's future opportunities to grow and be a vital part of the fabric of the city of Hamilton. We'll try this again. Uh, the, uh, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club has been part of the activities of the harbour for many years and in fact this year we'll be celebrating our 125th anniversary and I think that's probably more than uh, any other organisation or business on the bay. Um, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club will also play a pivotal part in the tall ships that are coming in this summer and in fact I've been uh, honoured by being asked to be the uh, head ship's liaison when they do come in to visit us and the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is actually going to be their home away from home when they need a little downtime. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club is the only learn to sail facility for juniors, adults and physically disabled sailors on the bay with membership in the Royal Hampton Yacht Club not required. In fact, less than 5% of the people who we run through our programs are put through, uh, are, are not the children of Royal Hampton Yacht Club members. The rest are the citizens of Hamilton and the surrounding area. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club also runs a number of major regattas each year for youths, adults, and able sail uh, competitors. These regattas bring a number of visitors into our city that support our local businesses, restaurants, and hotels. We're known around North America for the great regattas we organize and run. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club is the uh, center for boating e excellence. We're a private club uh, with community access. Besides our sailing programs, we run a number of other activities that are open to the public that I will touch on shortly. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club is an affordable uh, uh, alternative to other private clubs in the area, such as golf clubs, curling clubs, tennis clubs, etc. We're a full-service reciprocal destination for many cruisers from out of town. Um, last year we had over 800 boats come and visit us that brought people into the restaurants, the shops, the games and the shows in Hamilton. And the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is known uh, under Sail Canada's Development Centre, which recognizes us throughout the country as a leader in our sport. Um, the, uh, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is connected to and feel part of the community. Each year we uh, host the uh, uh, annual Easter Seals Regatta and so far have raised over $150,000 uh, to support children with disabilities. This regatta has many stakeholders in the Bay that help us out with this wonderful cause. Last year we had the honour of hosting the Mobility Cup with over 80 athletes from all over the world. The City of Hamilton was very generous in its support of this regatta and without a doubt was tagged by the competitors as the best regatta ever. This event had a budget of over $100,000 and we used well over 400 volunteers each day uh, to run this event. Some of you I know attended this event and it will always be a memory in my heart uh, what was going on down there. From running this wonderful event, it allowed us to make our club and our docks more accessible. We now run sailing programs twice a week uh, for physically disabled sailors. One of the Yacht Club's uh, great secrets is we actually work with the Boys and Girls Club of Hamilton to provide free of charge uh, sailing lessons for those who would otherwise never have the opportunity. In fact, roughly $100 of everybody's membership goes to support our Learn to Sail programs. Uh, the Hamilton, I'm not sure I'm in sync here, but the Hamilton Boating Community needs a full service yacht club uh, on the bay that offers competitive rates and services. Um, I'm sorry. Um, let me back up a minute if I may. Um, this year we started a Friday night concert series uh, that was fully open to the public. Uh, this event showcased local talent and allows many up and coming young musical, musical artists to uh, get the exposure they needed uh, while at the same time bringing folks down to the waterfront.
The Hamilton Boating Community needs a full service yacht club on the bay that offers competitive rates and services. With the possible closure of some marinas, the lack of water depths of Macassa Bay Yacht Club, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club will need more docks and more space for winter storage as people migrate to the Royal Hampton Yacht Club. Many boaters on the bay are looking to the RHYC to fill the future needs of, of, as RHYC members. Many boaters are looking for a facility they can get a total package from. Club membership, summer dockage, restaurant facilities, sailing programs, and winter storage. Something a marina cannot provide. To continue to support the citizens of Hamilton, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club needs to grow. There is a waiting list at the Macassa Bay Yacht Club and the Burlington Sailing and Boating Club for affordable winter storage spots. There is also a long waiting list for the limited spots at the Royal Hampton Yacht Club. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club must have uh, the ability uh, to, to have summer docks and winter storage for boats and its members, just like Macassa Bay, Hampton Bay Sailing Club, and every other successful yacht club on the lake. What the Royal Hampton Yacht Club is looking for in any new agreement with the, is the revenue streams from the following sources. Obviously the Royal Hampton Yacht Club owned administrative slips needs to start at 58 as spelled out in the draft letter of understanding and having that ability to get to at least 100 for Yacht Club members over time. This will need to be put into any final plan on dock layouts. We also need enough winter storage uh, for our members that equals about 80% of the summer spots. I say that because many members' boats will either take them home, take them to the Port Authority or some other location over the winter. In other words, if we had 100 slips, we'd need at least about 80 spots to store boats for the winter. As much as that would be nice to have it right next to the Yacht Club, I think if we could have somewhere along the bay with easy access, that would be fine. All this will obviously have to be tied into any long-term lease that we're now looking for. The financial security that would, uh, the financial security this would bring to the Yacht Club would allow us to build slips at no cost to the city. It would also allow us to further improve our facilities to reflect the West Harbour as the destination for Hamiltonians and visitors. It will allow us to continue to grow as a centre for boating excellence and training on the bay. Um, the uh, Royal Hampton Yacht Club wishes to continue as a partner with the city in the development of the West Harbour. We have been doing this for 125 years and we are very excited about the future. We have done a lot of work with Mohawk College and their Department of Architecture and Planning and looking ways of improving our facility and uh, the whole look of the club and the West Harbour. Many of city staff were uh, at the college when they made their eight presentations and were very excited about the possibility, as I am sure uh, city staff was. Russ, you've caught up to yourself. Do that slide. We're there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad somebody's looking after my back. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I'm almost done. The Royal Hampton Yacht Club applauds the city with moving ahead with its plans for the waterfront. This hidden jewel we have, as had for so many years, will finally open up to Hamiltonians and to visitors alike. We're obviously looking for revenue streams that keep our own docks and winter storage. This will allow us to continue to our support of the city as a full service club with support of our harbour, our training programs, our concert series, our charitable causes, our tourism and major regattas and events such as the tall ships that we've been asked to help out with this summer. Our future is bright. Once the agreement with the Hampton Port Authority is completed, the Royal Hampton Yacht Club uh, is hoping the city can finalize a long term lease with the club that will allow us to remain an integral part of the city. I got one right. I have to thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. It's always a pleasure to meet with you and talk with you. The city's been a long time supporter of the Yacht Club and we look forward to that continued support. We're all excited about the future possibilities of our West Harbour. We're also excited that the Royal Hampton Yacht Club will be part of this wonderful new era. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments if that's the Council's wish. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. And so it's safe to assume you fully support the staff recommendation in 7.2 today? That's correct. Okay. Councillor Collins. Just one quick question and then a comment, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Russ, thanks for coming in today. Um, so I, I think the theme, if, if I caught it correctly, and again, you've worked um, well with the city and, and other stakeholders over the last number of years. You've been an important part of the, uh, of the plan. The theme here is that you want to retain what you currently have, but you also need some room for expansion in the future, whether it's for storage or additional slips. 
and, and that expansion may also mean something that um, occurs on site at your building. Is that, is that a safe assumption to make today? That's but you correct. need the flexibility to grow in the future. As our waterfront grows, your club's going to grow along with it. That's correct, Councillor. Okay, thanks for that. That's my only question, Mr. Chairman. And I, I did want to thank Russ, Martin, and Laurel, and others who have been an integral part of the uh, planning process over the years. There's, it wasn't too many uh, years ago where no one wanted to be on the waterfront, save and except for the, the, boating, the recreational boating clubs. And, and so they were there during the tough times when it was uh, primarily industry. It wasn't uh, too long ago that Pier 8 and the lands around it were just a sea of asphalt. And basically we had our, our boating clubs there in the middle of all that. And, and so um, they've been certainly opening their doors to the community for a number of years. And, and as you know, and others around this table, we've had a good working relationship with their club since the city's become an active partner in the West Harbor area, since around or just before the, the year 2000. And so I, I wanted to thank their club for their contribution. Um, not only are they doing good things on the waterfront, but I, I think as uh, Russ alluded to in his, in his uh, presentation, sorry, they've been ambassadors for the city. We have thousands of people who flock to our harbor uh, during the summer months, um, recreational boaters who are coming from all over North America, and in some cases from other parts of the world. And the uh, Royal Hamilton Yacht Club and some of the other uh, clubs have been ambassadors for our city for, for decades, literally. And so I want to thank them for taking on that role and uh, for all the good work that they've done over the years. Thank you, Councillor. Well said. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Russ. Good seeing you and Martin and the others again today. Um, so, Russ, uh, I really appreciate the spirit and the tone of the uh, collaboration that you've come forward with today with your presentation, because if I recall last fall when I think you initially wanted to uh, present to committee and council, you had some concerns, but through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor DeRust, it sounds like in your discussions and consultations with Chris Phillips, with Al Dor, um, all the concerns of the club have now been satisfied through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just to rest for that confirmation. I, I would say that never all the concerns are covered, but certainly uh, understanding what the city is trying to do and how we'll be part of that. Uh, they've done an amazing job and we're fully supportive of what they're doing, yes. That's great. Uh, I really appreciate that, Russ. And uh, our staff, I know, have been working diligently in keeping us informed and with the setting sail now full steam ahead. So um, I, my, my support, and I, I think in your presentation today, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Russ, I really like, Russ, the fact that you folks have known all along you do a public good. But I think the perception for decades in our community has been the private club concept. And I'm really um, pleased, and I think you should, um, have available copies of this in various municipal facilities and elsewhere if you so desire on all the public good and the public invitations that you provide to your club because again I think that helps to dispel any lingering notion that you're a private club you're an exclusive club but all the great work you do um, goes a long way and this presentation has done a lot of that Russ so I commend you. Thank you Councillor. Thanks Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you Councillor Jackson. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you uh, Mr. To be mayor, I, um, you're not short, short of members in Ward 8 uh, that are uh, uh, allowed and uh, very committed to the, uh, the Yacht Club because I think I've heard from each and every one of them. And, uh, and of course, I was a big supporter and boater myself. Uh, and but I'm a recreational boater. I'm the one that's got the boat that goes in and comes out. And I don't need any permanent storage or, or, or permanent slippage. But the issues that I get when I go to... Um, um, the landing, the public landing, and, and meet a lot of recreational boaters. Because I believe that uh, there's reciprocal agreements with uh, a lot of the marinas. I'm not sure if there's a reciprocal agreement with uh, Royal Yacht Club with other uh, marinas in regards to uh, uh, services for their boaters. Is there, does that exist? I, I think the word reciprocal agreement is more so to do with cruisers in the summer where we can actually go to other yacht clubs and have reciprocal privileges at those clubs. Uh, that does not usually, or as far as I know, is never applied to things like uh, you know, winter storage and things like that. Okay. Um, and do you see uh, uh, with, with what the, the growth is taking place and the need and the demand that you've identified, uh, do you see any conflict with the recreational users, the smaller boats that are in and out, that uh, now that you have a, a waterfront that is great interest and in, in, in growing in regards to uh, the, the amenities, restaurants, and, 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 and other things, um, the, the area is limited uh, in regards to trying to accommodate those recreational users? 
I, I think we recognize that in talking to the city. Um, certainly, I think the general location for summer storage is there, and I use the word general. Uh, winter storage, we understand the city is still a little bit up for location, and I think during my presentation, I apologize if I had the wrong slide there, but we recognize that's an issue, and we may need to be a mile or two down the bay. So, you know, we're quite willing to work with the city to sort those kinds of things out. I appreciate it, and I've been a big supporter of uh, uh, the Royal Yacht Club, and I have to be. <laughs> I've got too many members of my ward, <laughs> and I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. I have no more, no Question? I'm going to be dinging all meeting long. Um, <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm being heard, so well, I'm thank you. I'm going to talk to about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So my question through you, Russ, welcome. Thank you for the presentation. Um, for anyone who hasn't eaten down at the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club, I do encourage folks to go down there. I quite often uh, uh, go down there for meetings. But my question through you, Chair, I'm not sure if it's to you or to staff. How does the Waterfront Banquet Centre lease figure into the, um, the Yacht Club? They're just strictly a tenant. They're, they're strictly a tenant, thank you. I didn't see them listed in here, but are they a tenant of the Yacht Club or a tenant of the city? Of the Yacht Club. All right, so you do receive revenue from the Waterfront uh, Banquet we, we Centre. Own, we own the building and we lease the upstairs to them. Thank you, so you do own the building and you do lease. Um, now the Chamber has moved out, so through you, Chair, do they have the entire upstairs at this point? No, there's two uh, facilities in there. Uh, help me here. What's the other one called? Ben ben Benefact. There's another company, which is an environmentally uh, and friendly company, uh, that has taken over the area that the chamber had before in the banquet center. So Benefact probably has 20% and the other part, the, the, the other 80%. Okay, thank you. I wasn't aware there were two uh, two companies in there. And C city staff actually helped us get that other tenant, which was great. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Good work, folks. And uh, the the length of the leases that you have with those other companies, how long would that be? How long have we had them? No, how long is the the lease? Like, what what is the term of the lease that the, that you have with the the current? Um, Businesses located in the if, if, I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but I think we have five years left in our lease, so that's all we can do with those facilities. And that is creating us some issues, trying to not having a long-term lease, having people putting capital additions with it. So there's, that's why I have some urgency to try and get this lease done sooner rather than later. And thank you through you, Chair. <laughs> Chair. That's what I was trying to tease out of all this, is just what, uh, what kind of timing and sense of urgency. We're about we five years here? too late. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, we have you, five years is what I'm hearing from you. So the lease is with these two companies, and you do receive the revenue. It does it, come into the Yacht Club. Yes, ma'am, yes. All right, and the city is aware of the, uh, of the yes. financial obligation there. Yes. And the tenants that are there, through you, Chair, just to confirm, they are responsible for the cost of all the upgrades and all the capital improvements. Is that correct? Uh, yes. All right, so that, that uh, cost doesn't come out of the Yacht Club. All right. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate you. you answering the questions. Thank you, Chair. I have no further questions. Can I have a motion to receive the delegation? Partridge, Pearson, all in favor? Carried. Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, members of the committee, I would now ask for a motion to move into closed session for two, pursuant to subsection 81E and F of the City of Hamilton Procedural Bylaws, section 239.2 of the Municipal Act as the subject matter pertains to uh, 8.1E litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board and 8.1F, uh, the receive advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that proposed with respect to proposed settlements of OMB appeals of development charges bylaw, uh, 09-143-09 and 144-11, 173-11, 174 slash 11, 175, and the, uh, with the Hamilton Halton Home Builders Association and Losani Homes 1998 Limited. Uh, members of the public are welcome to return to the council chambers once the committee has reconvened in open session. So, can I have a motion to go in camera? Councillor Pasuda, Councillor Pearson, all in favor? Sure. Carried. So, unless you're here for this uh, OMB settlement, I'd ask the council chambers to be vacated. presentation.
Chris Phillips now to do the, provide the presentations on item 7.1 and 7.2. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chris, for the introduction and thank you to members of council. So, uh, as Chris has certainly kind of made note of, we're here to kind of give you an update. Back in uh, when we were here in November of 2012, one of the things that council or count, a committee directed us to do was to come back periodically uh, every quarter with an update on what's going on in the waterfront and shoreline areas. And so today's presentation uh, happened to dovetail on the HPA MOU, which is the item 7.2. So we thought a great time to roll them all in together. I'm here actually joined by, uh, with Anita Fabak. One of the things that we're going to try to do with these um, update to council and to committee will be to kind of give you a sense of some of the very specific things that are going on. We'll give you a broad overview, but also get into some of the details. And Anita's been one of the members of the team that's working on the whole setting sail secondary plan. Because setting sail actually dates all the way back to 2005, and everybody knows that it's been approved at the OMB finally uh, now in 2013, I thought it was great to kind of get into some detail on setting sail, and so Anita is going to handle that part of the presentation. So as you can see, I'm going to kind of do a, a quick overview of some of the waterfront plans that we've got, a review of the corporate team structure that uh, Mr. Murray alluded to, give you a status update on some of the current uh, uh, waterfront and shoreline initiatives, uh, keeping in mind that there's two elements to the waterfront, the West Harbor that, that most people kind of always clue into and talk about, but there's also the fantastic shoreline along Lake Ontario and the Confederation Park area. Um, Anita's then gonna kind of talk about setting sail, review it, talk about the OMB appeal, and then we'll give you some of the next steps that are kind of going on. So with that said, I, I used this interactive map back in November to kind of really uh, kind of hone in and illustrate the complexity when we talk about the waterfront development, both from an internal city of Hamilton aspect, but also from a broader community. And so I'm using this kind of map just to flow through a couple key elements and, and uh, trying to highlight the areas as you see, because you can see uh, through the map and through the interactive inter, uh, nature of it, that many of them overlap. And part of our role here from a staff perspective has really been to try to, to uh, uh, smooth out the, the edges, make sure we're all going in the same direction, and make sure that the things are coordinate, coordinated in a way that, that uh, effectively um, reaches all of our goals. So the yellow outline there is really the setting sail secondary plan area. So that everybody realizes when Anita kind of takes the stage here in a few minutes, setting sail is actually much broader than just the water front itself. It actually goes into the broader neighborhoods and is outlined uh, there in the map. We have the Barton Tiffany, what we call internally the Barton Tiffany owned lands. These are the lands that were originally assembled by council's direction uh, where you actually made a, an upfront investment. These were the lands that were uh, assembled originally for the stadium and now certainly form a great uh, opportunity for us to redevelop. We've laid in here the recreational master plan. Council actually endorsed this master plan back a, a few years ago. I'm kind of blanking on the date. I think it's 2010. Endorsed this plan. It was created by both the city in partnership with the Hamilton Waterfront Trust, and we've overlaid that onto there. We are uh, dealing in the next item, 7.2. There was negotiations ongoing with the Hamilton Port Authority on a memorandum of understanding to get uh, Piers 7 and 8 lands uh, back um, into city's control uh, from the leases from there. And we've also engaged servicing studies in the entire Piers 5, 6, 7, and 8 area, kind of uh, doing that project up front to kind of get to a point to figuring out and understanding how do we service the area. There's a, oh, okay. There's then all these kind of um, indirect relationships that I, I mentioned before. Certainly from a council perspective and a corporate perspective, the neighborhood initiative has, has been really key. And many of the areas that have been singled out in the neighborhood strategy are actually in this area. So I'm highlighting here that Beasley, Jamesville, Strathcona, the North End West neighborhood and the North End East are all in this area, all overlap in one way or another. And the fact that they overlap means that we need to ensure that we're coordinating so that every, the things that are done and the components that are of, of vital importance to those particular neighborhoods are also seen as part of the broader plan moving forward. 
And then there's things that are kind of totally outside of the, the waterfront itself, but have direct impact on the long-term future. The future GO station at James North is a perfect example. And then there's other things like, for instance, City Housing Hamilton has a variety of properties in this particular area as well. They're city assets, they're public assets, and, and uh, how we utilize those um, down the road are, are certainly key to the whole area. So when you look at just these 12 things alone, you see that the complexity of working in this area is something that we're, we're certainly taking uh, a note of and we're certainly looking at um, uh, very carefully. Just to take it one step further, this is one aspect which shows that the complexity, this is just the recreation master plan concept plan. Each one of those bubbles indicates a very specific project that was identified in the plan and will need to be either be built or constructed or operated down the path. And I only put this up here just to show that the plan itself if you look at it traditionally, from a project by project basis, looks like a collection of projects. But the reality is that it's all part of a plan, it's all part of a basis, uh, and it all kind of fits together. And how we go and actually phase this thing is, is the difference between success and, and not so much so. And that's what we're kind of focused on. Not to be... Uh, to, to leave it alone uh, on the West Harbor Confederation Park, although I didn't go through an interactive map as such on, on that side of things, has the exact same complexity to it. And this is the facility analysis that our PW people have, uh, have done as it relates to Confederation Park. And if I look at just this area as an example, the next slide kind of shows how the transformation can exist and how these projects really kind of flow. This area here is the old campground, which is now kind of slated and looking to actually be converted into more of a recreational sports park, uh, having all sorts of different amenities, both for, for playground, active recreation, as well as a, a, a cricket pitch and stock, soccer pitches on it. So it does try to get to the complexity of the nature. And I keep, I'm, it's gonna be a theme that you're certainly going to hear for both council's uh, consideration, but also for the public. The waterfront redevelopment and the waterfront plans is a process. It's a process that has lots of different moving parts, and the idea of us trying to coordinate it in a fashion is crit critical as we go forward. Internally, how have we done this? You've seen this chart before. I just want to quickly kind of go through it. Council certainly through the strategic plan made the waterfront area and the shoreline area really key elements. SMT from their direction, Mr. Murray, Mr. McCabe, and, and Mr. Davis specifically, but SMT as, as a whole, uh, have made this a priority in the strat plan as well, and set out staff on, on a road to make sure that it becomes a priority all the, through the organization as well. They assigned me as the position to kind of try to coordinate this element, and I've kind of gone through the organization and been able to partner with two specific people, uh, Mr. Aldor and Lawrence Stasiak, who, uh, who Mr. Murray mentioned earlier on, who've been fantastic to form a steering committee, the three of us, in trying to move these initiatives forward. And not to be lose sight of the fact that the Hamilton Waterfront Trust, although not under the umbrella of the, of the city of Hamilton specifically, is a key player and a key partner in us moving forward. And we've uh, reached out and ensured that we're, uh, we're partnering with them all the way through. But we've also created a, a decentralized kind of focus in, in the organization where instead of taking people from where they are, developing an entire bureaucracy, unto itself on the waterfront. We've devised several key working teams throughout the organization. And so we've established them into, into focus areas, engineering being a key part of it, and there you see some of, the, some of the key people there. Planning architectural team, an economic development working team that really fo will focus on the kind of uh, economic uplift in the area. A financing working team that will, uh, will establish the financing strategy that we've been directed to do. As well as we've added two new boxes since the last time we met, one being the operating units working team, and although nobody assigned to it, the recognition has been made from our group here that many of the elements, especially those balloons, if I went back to the, the, uh, the rec master plan, many of the bubbles in there will have operating impacts, or what we do on the project basis will impact the operating units. And our, our intent here is to ensure that those operating units are actually brought into the process at the beginning of the planning stage. 
stage. So we plan on doing that. And lastly, we've added a communications working team uh, that will actually focus on uh, key elements uh, relating to communicating both to you, to the public, to the broader community, uh, to, to really kind of reinforce it. And not, not losing, uh, going back to the indirect relationships, you see here that there's several other groups that are already working on things throughout the city. Um, some of them will come and go. As you see there, the HPA MOU setting sail in the Breakwater EA shoreline groups were already established before we created this. And down the road, they will likely come off and other ones will go on and that sort of, that sort of thing as the projects kind of gear up and need a team to themselves. And then as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole other set of groups that are also working in the, in the area themselves. So big picture, we've created a, a really unique but I think a, a really exciting group across the corporation where we've been able to tap into the talents of, uh, of everybody involved. Not going to go through the projects specifically, but this, this is now kind of an update on the current projects themselves. As you can see, there's a few things that are clearly complete in here, and, and uh, setting sail being one of them uh, that Anita will speak to in a second. Um, at PW committee, uh, I believe last week, uh, there was a report relating to the EA and the breakwater and shoreline, so that's certainly an element here. Uh, the MOU, is, as we've already said, is the 7.2 on here, and uh, the servicing studies are ongoing. You see that there's other works in progress that have both been funded uh, in, the, in the 2013 capital budget, and they equate all the way to 20. So the intent here is just to show the breadth of projects that are out there happening within the corporation that are focused on the waterfront. What I wanted to do in a lead up in kind of a transition to the setting sail component is to also show that although we're here today talking about these great plans for the waterfront, waterfront redevelopment, waterfront renewal started long before I ever got here and started, was, was conceived by people who are both here around the council chamber, some who are here in the audience today, others who haven't, and many members of the community. And I'm just going to kind of go through a series of slides that just kind of show the impact that the waterfront has had in the area uh, beyond the things that we talk about today. In 1992, Bayfront Park was, was introduced and opened in 1993. And could you think about a time when Bayfront wasn't actually there? And that is actually a um, kind of really kind of starts to set the stage that the, and the redevelopment and the renewal of the waterfront is really a process that's going on. And that uh, us and our team here are actually just building upon the foundation that's been laid a long time before we got here. Pier 4 was in 93. And look at those kind of shots to kind of show how it's there. The Millennium Trail and the trail system in, in 2000. The fact that environmental sustainability, uh, the water itself, the ecological effect, the cleaning up of the harbour were all elements that were kind of created through BARC, through interest group, through RAPS, uh, through, through many of the people who have worked here in the waterfront area. The Waterfront Trust was established in 2000, and here's just a variety of, obviously, images that both the trust, with the help and support of the city and others in the community, have gone on to, to do down there in the area. And Haida and the Discovery Center, which is now a great location for restaurants, is, uh, uh, just kind of really shows the different kind of dynamic down there. And I put this slide up, and I, I think it was Councillor Collins who mentioned something earlier on. Although a grainy photograph there on the right, I think, or on my right, I think this kind of illustrates though the notion of the, the successes that have been had to date. That photo on the right is give or take around the 80s, and that's Pier 8 as a working port. Ships off on all the side, if you saw the, the photo much clearer, like I can kind of see on the screen, you see steel and other things kind of laying on it. And that's Pier 8 today. That's all happened in 20, 30 years. And so what we're talking about here on doing is about building on the basis of the successes that have already kind of been laid as, as we kind of go forward. And I think that picture there kind of really does sum up, up some of the stuff that we're kind of doing on the waterfront. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Anita to really kind of get down to the notion of what is setting sail and why is the fact that setting sail uh, is now in place so important to us moving forward. Thanks, Chris. Good morning. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about 
the setting sail secondary plan, why it came about, a little bit about um, the OMB appeals and the decisions and really just moving forward. So the secondary plan came about as a response to opportunities that existed in the West Harbour. And Chris mentioned quite a number of them being Bayfront Park and the number of trails and the other amenities that existed in the area. And also the, just generally the proximity of the neighbourhood to the waterfront and the fact that the city was investing in properties and had acquired the waterfront properties. So all of this brought about the need for a comprehensive plan for future development. The secondary plan provides a framework for public improvements and private development that are all aimed at enhancing the area. There's two primary purposes to the plan. The first is to guide the detailed planning, zoning, and development decisions. And secondly, to identify the city's priorities for publicly funded initiatives. The planning process began in the summer of 2002, along with a parallel transportation study, which was the West Harbor Transportation Management Plan. The plan was approved by council in 2005 and was subsequently appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board. The city received five OMB appeals from BNM Metal Recycling, Canadian National Railway, Harbour West Neighbours and North Ed Neighbourhood Association, Ream and Tim Hortons Limited. There were a number of reasons that were outlined in the appeals, and the appeals dealt mainly with the prohibition of drive-through uses throughout the secondary plan area, the identification of Barton Tiffany lands as residential, and then the impact that this would have on the existing industrial in the area, the discussion around the relocation of the Stewart Street rail yard, the proximity of the rail yard to proposed residential, and vehicular traffic and impact on the neighborhood that the plan may bring about. There were three decisions that were issued by the board. Just as background, the uh, Ream and B&M &M, &M Metals properties were eventually acquired by the city through the stadium considerations, and as a result, their appeals were no longer valid. The Tim Horton settlement really just brought about greater clarity with respect to the prohibition of drive-throughs and where drive-throughs would be prohibited. This was um, narrowed down to James Street North, portions of Barton Street and Pier 8. The Ontario Municipal Board dismissed the appeal from the North End neighbours. They found that the appropriate mix of traffic calming and, and um, traffic management measures were included within the transportation management plan, and therefore no changes to the secondary plan or the traffic management plan would be required. And finally, the CN settlement brought about changes to the Barton Tiffany area and the types of land uses that were identified. This was really important to the city. It was really finally the point at which we could start to move forward, looking towards implementing the vision of the secondary plan and moving forward with various waterfront developments. The secondary plan is based on a number of core princ principles that revolve around the promotion of a healthy harbour, strengthening the neighbourhoods, providing public access to the waterfront, creating a diverse and animated waterfront, and enhancing the, the um, visual and physical connections that exist. The West Harbour area is really a series of public spaces, different views and vistas, and the secondary plan took a really strong lead from, these, from this public realm and built upon the framework by identifying and protecting additional key views, augmenting the existing parkland that existed, and improving public access to the waterfront, all the while creating and maintaining those strong links back to the neighbourhood. The secondary plan really focused on where appropriate development could occur and where these area, and what these areas of change should look like. The purpose of that was to really focus development and to protect the stable residential neighbourhoods. So the setting sail plan identifies three areas of change. The first being the waterfront area, which is identified as number one, it's kind of a pinky yellowy colour, which includes Bayfront Park and Piers 6 through 10. The policies of the secondary plan really focused on promoting the harbour and promoting active and passive enjoyment of the harbour through trail links and parks and open spaces and plazas. And also through accommodating waterfront appropriate commercial amenities and other marine recreation. The second area of change that was identified was the Barton Tiffany area. The plan really focused on the promotion of relocating the remaining industrial lands that were there the remediation of any contaminated lands, and the conversion of industrial lands to residential. 
The settlement with CM brought about significant changes to this. It went from a residential area to one that was more mixed use with a focus on commercial, some residential through medium density and a small pocket of low density residential. The third area of change that was identified was the Ferguson-Wellington corridor. The policies also promoted the relocation of any remaining industrial lands, the remediation of any contaminated lands, and the conversion of the industrial lands to commercial, institutional, or residential uses. The setting sales secondary plan also promoted corridors of gradual change. These were found along York Boulevard, Barton Street, Cannon Street, and James Street. The goal of these was to enhance the corridors through imp incremental changes, all the while acknowledging the function that these corridors have within the neighborhood. Redevelopment within these corridors is to respect the scale and character of the adjacent residential neighborhoods and provide the appropriate transition to these neighborhoods through appropriate massing and heights. The remaining lands within the setting cell secondary plan are identified as stable residential, and the plan really preserves this character and only really looks at small incremental changes. The setting cell secondary plan also included a detailed implementation plan that outlined future studies that would be needed. These included a parks master plans for Bayfront, Bayview, Eastwood, Central, and Pier 4 parks. The secondary plan also identified the need for the West Harbor Marine Recreation Master Plan for Bayfront to Pier 7, which would really look at a much more detailed level of planning, looking at specific land uses, the alignment and des design of different waterfront trails, and even the size of open spaces. What would also would be required would be an implementing official plan and zoning bylaw amendment. The secondary plan also identified the need for action strategies for Pier 7 and 8, and streetscape, streetscape and trail studies for Bay, James, and John Streets. And finally, urban design studies for Pier 7 and 8 and the Barton Tiffany area were identified. And really the purpose of these studies would be to build on what was identified through the secondary plan, to build on the land uses that were identified and the vision that was established through the planning process. And really the urban design studies will look at the form and function of these areas and what development should look like. So really, Oh, well, one last thing I wanted to identify, and Chris mentioned some of these in his presentation, but there's been a lot that has happened since setting sale was approved, or even since the process started. One being the arts investments along James Street North, the identif identification of James Street North and the GO station, the A-Line LRT connection, the Hamilton General Hospital redevelopment, the trail to Pier 8, and the uh, Williams Cafe and the Ice Rink and the Discovery Center developments at Pier 8. So really what these investments show is a continued interest and support and commitment of the waterfront and the beginning of implementation of the vision of the secondary plan. So I'll just turn it back to Chris now. Thank you. So just to wrap up, so that uh, it doesn't look like it's just purely an update, I do want to know, I do want you to see on this slide that there are very key things and timelines that we've put in place on many critical factors here, and this is a listing of them, and, and that uh, in our quarterly update when we come to next time, uh, we certainly will have uh, very clear things to bring you uh, from that. Just to kind of wrap up uh, on this whole notion of the update, I think the left-hand side of this really shows what setting sail is all about, when you boil it all down to, is building on the successes that are there before and making the Hamilton waterfront a place where new development can happen and coexist with many of the great things that have taken place down there already. And part of our role that we want to, to is to reach out and take some of that community interest that we know is out there and we know is bubbling up. And on the right-hand side there, that's just a screenshot from cbc.ca that I saw on the weekend. There's actually a middle school class uh, that I think we should bring in at some point in time. But there's actually on CBC's, I'd say this, a four minute video uh, news clip on there's a middle school class that's using the Barton Tiffany lands and a computer program to basically go in and try to redevelop it. And it's how do we tap into that enthusiasm that's out there in the community? Now that we've got um, so much of the foundation laid, let's tap into the community interest that's out there in order to help us uh, bring the, the whole plan to life. And with that said, I'm done the update. Okay, thanks Chris. Is there any questions of the, either Chris or Anita? Okay. Oh, uh, Councillor Pearson. 
Thank you, Ms. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chris and Anita. Excellent presentations. Chris, just in your last comment, the middle school, is that a school in that area? Um, I, I wish I, I knew. I just, uh, I happened to watch the clip. I was really hoping to actually be able to, uh, to put the clip on. I'm not sure whether the school is or whether the teacher lives there. Uh, because they totally make it clear, and I haven't had the opportunity to follow up. But uh, I think it's really interesting on how, uh, how the community out there is engaged, and we just need to go and uh, tap into it. Right, and I, I think that's a fabulous idea, and having them come in and see how what we're doing on this side to what they're doing on the other side can marry. Um, and it, it is excellent to think that these may be students that live in this neighborhood. They're the future home buyers and, and residents that will live there and taking ownership to their community. So great, great initiative if, if you can make that come to fruition, Chris. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have no other questions. So um, I need a motion to receive the presentations. Uh, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Collins, discussion. All in favor? Carried. Now before we question, <coughs> a motion to approve the recommendations and report CM 12015A. I have to have an amendment to add to subsection F to remove the item from the outstanding business list. I need that amendment. Okay, so yeah, so uh, the clerk suggested maybe we should have the motion that does both at the same time, and so we get uh, item seven point two presented to us first. Okay, so then we'll make one all-encompassing motion for both seven one and seven two. So, Chris, do you want to proceed with seven point two then, which is the uh, memorandum of understanding? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So the same sort of a review, this, this here uh, is, is a very specific, does have uh, recommendations, it's not an update, uh, reports uh, been distributed uh, to council. Um, staff team, uh, what I'm going to try to, uh, try to go through here in really high level, a brief way is I uh, give you a review of the direction that we were sent away with back in uh, August, give you a review or, or kind of uh, an overview of the main elements of this memorandum of understanding. That is tough to say uh, up here in a microphone. Uh, um, just a quick uh, on the financial uh, kind of aspects of it uh, and leading into our recommendations. This chart here just kind of shows you where we're at in the process for this. And I, I know that it's kind of, it seems like it's a long time coming, but there is a stepped process to this. Back in August, you approved what we had was a basic letter of understanding with the Hamilton Port Authority on the same issue. The next step, you gave approval to that, and the next step was to negotiate an, an MOU, uh, which, which gives a little bit more details, uh, hashes out some of the more finer points on the LOU, but it's still kind of a structural document. Today I'm before you here looking for approval for the MOU, but it's not, uh, it's not the final step in this process by any stretch. You, we still, uh, part of our recommendations are to send us away to negotiate an actual management agreement for the operation of the marina. We would then bring that back in July, and that it would be at that point in time that you would then approve the operating agreement or the management agreement, and then we, the next step would be the implementation. And this would all feed into uh, basically the capital budget forecast that we've been directed by council uh, back in the last uh, the last time we were uh, we were here is to come up with a 2014 to 2024 capital fa phasing plan as well as a financing strategy. So I do want to make sure that everybody's clear on the outset that this is really the approval of the MOU, and we would still be coming back to you with final approval. And I would be remiss, before I go kind of any further, to thank the uh, representatives from the uh, Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. We have had a great dis uh, discussions with them, and I am, uh, I'm glad that we've been able to form what I think is a great partnership kind of moving forward. We recognize as a staff level that there are uh, concerns. Uh, we've tried to deal with the concerns as best we can in here. At the same time, we've also tried to stress the fact that, that this is a process. There's a lot of complexities. and. Uh, just to your benefit, uh, I'll reiterate here just publicly that the notion that we know that a long-term lease is in is what exactly uh, the, the Yacht Club's looking for. And our commitment, and I can go back to a conversation Mr. Murray and I had uh, with representatives from the Yacht Club, maybe dating back some four years ago, uh, what was the notion that everything that we're doing down here, we're assuming sustainability for the long-term for the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club in the area as well. 
Um, council direction uh, w uh, was uh, the HPA in the strategic plan, um, there are some key elements uh, that, that relate to it. And unlike some elements of the strat plan, uh, the stuff as it relates to the waterfront that's on the screen here, some of it's very specific and very pointed. And I only raise this here to show that, that this issue before you right now is actually right in the strat plan. Uh, it's number three you see there, negotiate early termination of the land lease in the Pier 7 and 8. And many of the other elements that kind of are on this page as well feed into the fact of whether this deal actually happens or not. Because the, the timing of this land becomes key to the phasing plan of, of everything else. Back in August, we brought you the LOU. Um, there, there was a, and council approved the direction to go away and negotiate the MOU, and that is what we're bringing you today. The MOU itself, uh, the elements of them are, uh, are, um, are, are similar and, and are uh, searching for the words here. They actually, uh, uh, the intent of the LOU is clear in the MOU that we, uh, that we uh, negotiated, and the original letter, I believe, is Appendix B to your report here as well. The key elements, though, of the deal are, are as you start to see on the screen. First one is that it terminates the land lease. That's currently, uh, these are city-owned lands right at the moment based on, a, based on an agreement back in the year 2000 between then the uh, City of Hamilton and the Harbor Commissioners. There's a lease on the Pier 7 and 8 lands, uh, one of them being in 20, uh, 2015, the other in 2025. What this deal basically will do is it will give city full control over Pier 7 and 8 immediately upon execution of the agreement. Uh, there's no direct compensation to the HPA for this. We're not paying for the lease. Uh, we, we get the lands back. And that the year 2000 lease agreements will actually be terminated uh, going all the way back to that original lease. In return, what this does give is this gives the, the HPA, uh, they will receive a 25 year operating lease on the marina, give or take from 2013 to 2038. They also will have an option to extend to another 25 years, but that option's at mutual consent, the, both the city and the, and the port authority themselves. It also calls for, and, and this speaks to some of the discussions we've had with the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club, which I think was, a, was an issue that arose back in August. It, it basically takes today, it, it separates out the slips into two, uh, into two factors, the present day and the expansion. Presently, there's give or take 358 slips in total. Give or take, approximately 300 of those slips uh, are controlled or are managed by the Hamilton Port Authority and, and approximately 58 to the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. Um, there, this agreement allows for expansion of the marina, which actually is contained in the recreational master plan. That expansion uh, gives it an increase to be expanded of 550 in total. Approximately 508 of those would be for the HPA, and the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club would be assigned 42 of those, taking their total up to 58, which coincides with, I believe, the Yacht Club's uh, an initial um, ask of 100, uh, although I, I certainly um, know that they've asked for, for potentially more growth opportunities. The other elements, and, and uh, this was certainly brought up by, by, the, uh, by uh, the representatives from the Yacht Club, the boat storage facility is a real key element to this entire deal, quite frankly, to the sustainability of all the boating clubs uh, down there in the, in the area. Um, what this MOU does is it ties directly the boat storage issue to the marine operations. As a business, the, the revenues from both the on the water and the winter storage go in together to make the business case for the overall uh, marine operation. So what this MOU does is it directly ties the two things together. This is actually of benefit to the city. What it ensures is that the boat storage in the marina as a business unit will continue in perpetuity in this agreement. It also means that no initial, and, and uh, certainly an issue that the Yacht Club brought up, the fact is this agreement does not solve for the long term the boat storage location. But what it does do is it does allow for us to proceed in the, with the current operation remaining intact. And there is clearly a relocation clause that gives the city the right to move, to have the facility boat storage relocated when development opportunities appear on Pier 7 and 8. 
Finally, on the city-owned marina, and I, I want to kind of emphasize the fact that, that currently this marina is, is city-owned, it's our assets. The, the capital kind of costing of this in the agreement calls for the city to be responsible for the capital costs of the shoreline, the breakwater wave break, and the replacement of the existing slocks, these uh, slips. This is our assets today and we're responsible for those. Going forward, this MOU clearly uh, lays out the fact that 100% of the cost of the slip expansion will be borne by the uh, um, Port Authority, and 100% of the new boat storage facility capital investment will be by the HPA. As well, the HPA will take, uh, take responsibility for all the maintenance costs of the entire marine operation. Lastly, just to kind of focus and look at the revenue side of things, currently at present, it's basically, this agreement basically uh, it reinforces the status quo. 100% of all the existing uh, marina and sto boat storage revenue continues to flow to the uh, Port Authority. The subleases in this particular MOU, the subleases on the lands that, that uh, come back to the city will be transferred to the city. We've agreed uh, to, to have a revenue sharing um, agreement for future revenues on the expanded marina. Although the actual details of that have not been negotiated yet, it, uh, it does remain in there. And so that the city to ensure and put uh, attention on, uh, on, on getting that agreement in place, we've also put in place the fact that a time frame that the capital expenditures that lead to the, uh, to the replacement of the current marina, which would be to the benefit of, of the marine, marine operator, would be tied to that, uh, that revenue sharing agreement being made. As far as the capital cost estimates go, they're, uh, they're in, the, um, in the report. The shoreline improvements, as you uh, heard in, in a detailed report uh, on the shoreline EA uh, last week for, at Public Works, Committee, the estimated cost is $12.2 million on the shoreline rehabilitation for give or take the piers five through seven in the main basin element. I will say that this is slightly lower than the number in the PW report back in Monday. That's because their report also included the shoreline outside of this area, including the Macassa Bay kind of area. Um, this is identified in the 10-year capital forecast although only partially, and it's certainly clear that it's, it's unfunded at this moment in time. On the shoreline protection, the breakwater wave break cost estimates about $5.4 million. That actually was approved at $5.2 million in the 2013 capital budget. The marine upgrade, the upgrade of the slips, the current slips, the current capacity is estimated to be about $4.2 million. The MOU puts a a, before a best effort state of approximately 2017, and uh, in, in which would be the responsibility of the city. But the HPA would be responsible for all the uh, capital for the expansion and also for the maintenance going forward. All that leading to the recommendations that uh, that you have uh, have before you. Um, a being that you approve the MOU. Um, B being uh, that that we go uh, that the city manager is given uh, the right to execute the agreement. Uh, C that we're we're putting uh, in here a proposal recommendation that you actually approve the funding and have us go away and figure out a phasing plan from 2014 to 2017 capital budgets. That based on the area and and the entire plan and the breadth of the plan that outlined earlier on in my update that we, uh, we also set out to seek alternative funding options available, including direct, indirect Hamilton sources, as well as uh, triple P's, uh, senior levels of government, et cetera. And finally, uh, E, that uh, you direct us to go and actually negotiate the management agreement. With that said, I'm uh, happy to take hey, Thank you, Chris. And uh, I could tell you in the six years I've been on council, Every time I've seen a presentation on setting sail, it's always been a number of different positions between the city and users and property owners. And this is the first time I've ever seen one where everybody seems to be united. So congratulations. So I have a speaker's list. I have uh, Councillor Collins, Councillor Jackson, and Councillor Whitehead. But just uh, one quick question and then a comment, Mr. Chairman, uh, through you to Chris. Chris, part of the original agreement that we had with the uh, Port Authority, the former Harbor Commission, was that uh, in 2015, we would uh, take over Pier 7, it was the first parcel of land that was to come back to us as part of the original 
uh, MOU that we signed with the, uh, the Port Authority. And uh, part of that agreement was the transfer of the, um, of the buildings, was the transfer of the inventory of all their machines, the lifts, the employees even. Um, that's now, just to be clear, that's not part of this. All of that inventory of capital goods and the employees that currently work for the Port Authority will remain with the Port Authority as part of the new operation at the marina, part of the extended um, lease, if you want to call it that, on, on that land. Is Just to be clear. Through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, yes, that's correct. And uh, I'm also kind of looking to the experts we all have in the, in the audience as well. Thanks, I, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I um, first thank uh, Chris for the presentation and, um, and the entire team. I know that, um, as Chris mentioned, uh, Aldor, Lawrence Daziak, um, Mr. Murray, um, Mr. Zudema before he, he left our employ, um, there's a whole team of individuals who've worked to get us to a point now where we're actually prepared to start implementing some of our plans. And, and that's been probably our biggest challenge over the last number of years. I've spent the better part of my political career since the day we signed the agreement with the former Harbor Commission, and it was a, a fairly good agreement. It was the agreement that gave us the money for the Waterfront Trust, and we've made strategic investments across the city there. But it was also agreement that, that transferred the ownership of Piers 7 and 8 to us. And as part of those discussions, and former Commissioner uh, Laurel Thompson is, joins us here today as now not a, uh, a commissioner, but as someone who's a strong supporter of the waterfront and someone who's part of the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. Um, as part of that agreement that we signed, uh, you know, the discussions we had at the time was that the Port Commission required these lands for their operations and, and they needed time to transfer some of the storage issues and, and some of the uh, moorings and other things that have taken place over the years at this location. They needed time to transfer those operations to other parts of the harbor. But I think what we quickly recognized after 2000, as soon as we um, took possession of Windermere Basin and some other things, is that this was such an underutilized area. And, um, and so it's always been our goal, collectively, I think, um, to try to secure these lands as quick as possible to implement the master plan, the setting sail document that we have, to try to generate more residential uses, to try to generate more commercial uses, to increase tax assessment. I mean, this is really the poster child, I think, as you've pointed out through your presentation, Chris, this is the poster child for what intensification and inner city redevelopment should look like. And so I, I'm, um, I'm so thankful for the fact that um, you and others have picked up the torch and have done a tremendous job to get us where we are today, certainly with council's involvement. And I have to say, too, that um, I think where we turned the corner was the, um, the hiring of, of Mr. Murray. And we actually, although we had setting sail in place, to be honest, the waterfront uh, development plans that we had were not part of our strategic plan. And it took one-off motions to come to this table to look at the trail extensions that we've experienced to uh, build the Williams Cafe, to put the trolley on the water. I mean, a lot of those were done through the Waterfront Trust, but they needed the city's involvement. And they were one-off motions that would come here to really try to move the waterfront forward, but we never really had a, a plan in place. And I think it was with Mr. Murray's hiring and his work now with SMT and their focus on working with council to get a strategic plan in place that shows a short, medium, and long-term vision as to what the waterfront should look like over a period of time. And the fact that, the, that it was at Mr. Murray's direction through council that um, we have a team in place that's dedicated to waterfront initiatives, I think has really served not just this council, but the community well. And we've had almost everyone on the same page. And it wasn't, as, as the chairman just pointed out, usually when we've dealt with waterfront initiatives around this table, um, we've never found uh, unanimity. And we've always had one or more stakeholders working against us, whether it's the Port Authority, the recreational boating clubs. You know, we, we had to go through that idea years ago from the consultant of amalgamating all the, the recreational boating clubs into one facility. And, and council, in their wisdom, decided that that wasn't the way to go, and so we resolved that. But there always seemed to be hiccups and hurdles along the way, trying to appease one group or another. North End neighbors are the same. We now have the traffic management plan in place and the re resolution of the OMB. And so we've, we've found ways to make it work, and I think we've done that through collaboration, and we've done that uh, collectively. And, and this is, I think, we would all recognize the first term of council, where council is working together by and large, 
and uh, council is working with our staff. And, and so, as I said earlier, the, the stars have aligned and, and, and to be clear, I've been probably one of the biggest uh, critics of the, uh, the former Harbour Commission and, and the Port Authority in the past. I, I, um, I have Eastport Drive and I've always had some land use conflicts with them and, and certainly their past direction that they had and some of the demands that they had after we signed the agreement in terms of trying to reach this deal. I mean, if I could publicly say what some of the dollar figures and some of the other terms and conditions were, not certainly from Mr. Wood or the current board, but the past boards that we've been working with, the demands were as, almost as long as our arm and you know, probably in value were five or six times what we're looking at right now. And so they were certainly unpalatable and, and wouldn't fly politically. But now we have actually a board in place at the port and it looks like a staff, uh, certainly a, a senior management team at the port that are willing to work with the city and try to move this area forward. This is so underutilized, this area. And uh, it was, ironically, it was about uh, 20 years ago now that I uh, visited that one shot that you had up there, Chris, and when we heard the reference to the tall ships today in Russ's presentation, and at that time, when you visited Pier 8 to look at the tall ships in 1984, you were essentially standing on a massive asphalt pad among all kinds of industrial storage and you were standing behind a fence and people were trying to find ways and means in which to take pictures of the ships without seeing the crosshatch uh, frost fence in front of them and and so so much has changed in 20 years and I think that was the the point that you were making through your your original presentation prior to 7.2 here so I'm I'm just um, I have to say that you know I've I'm just so happy that we've arrived at a point where we can start implementing some of these plans and start seeing some of the good things that come from it. And I'm so thankful that we have a very talented team uh, working with the Waterfront Trust, working with our recreational boating community, the Port Authority, and, and all the neighbors that live not just in the North End but across the city. We're in a position now where we're going to move this area forward, and it's um, certainly through the hard effort of uh, the, the good efforts of those people who've worked, in some cases, as was pointed out, for decades when we start to include those people who've made investments at some of the uh, private clubs. People have worked decades to get us to this point, and uh, I think we, we owe those people a, uh, a big thank you uh, for carrying the torch that long and passing it along to people like yourself and uh, certainly Mr. Murray, our management team, and others who've worked so hard, Mr. Doerr and um, the Waterfront Trust. So I, I'm sorry to go on with all those thank yous, but uh, this is a long time coming, and I think we've reached a point where good things are on the horizon as it relates to our waterfront, and we can continue progress made, um, not just in 2013, but beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Madam Deputy Mayor, what an outstanding, eloquent speech. Uh, Councillor Collins has just uh, shared with us, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and um, I think he has so captured and summarized exactly um, the evolution uh, that's happened in the last roughly 25 years, Madam Chair, and if you indulge me just to Further, I got one or two small questions for Chris, but just to pick up on the outstanding um, comments of Councillor Collins, I remember when Councillor Morelli and I were uh, uh, chairs of the old Parks and Rec Committee, along with uh, Mayor Morrow's leadership back in the 90s, and we opened Bayfront Park in 92. Uh, people, um, as Chris Phillips has said, very few people remember that that 30-acre uh, park, Bayfront Park, used to be the old Waxman Industrial Site. And uh, to see the transformation today is just amazing. And I tell people about even the beach strip that Councillor Collins represents, the transformative work down on the beach strip as well, which the city has been an integral part of, again, working alongside of partners like the Conservation Authority and the Waterfront Trust. Um, to see today the economic spin-offs along the beach strip where there are today executive townhomes that are selling for $400,000 on our beach strip I would have been laughed out of this chamber 25 years ago if I had even suggested that. So, Madam Chairman, um, I, uh, I want to commend Chris. Chris has uh, quarterbacked this uh, file so capably since he's been uh, hired uh, with the city a few years ago. Chris, I want to commend you. I love your corporate team structure that you showed us in item 7.1 under the, um, um, the shoreline update, uh, waterfront and shoreline update. Uh, to Chris Murray, the city manager, I can't, I can't think of in all my years here um, where so much staff across all departments and working with community partners like the Waterfront Trust and others, I can't think of, and looking at that corporate team structure organizational chart that Chris put up in the previous presentation, 
I can't think of another initiative where I've seen so much emphasis and collaboration across all departments of the city saying that not only is this a high priority, but we want to build on the momentum of what's been done in the past because this is image changing stuff that's occurring down at the West Harbor, Madam Chair. And um, I just, I, I'm, I'm just proud to be such, to be a supporter of it and to uh, carry on, especially with the work at the Waterfront Trust and the city staff, Chris, and Al Dore, Lawrence Stasiak, and Rob Norman, and so many others that, um, that have just continued to provide um, out um, initiatives, designs, plans to not only for the citizens of Hamilton, but for tourists and visitors alike to our city. And just as the whole image of our city is changing, the waterfront, in my opinion, has been the most important part of that. Chris, a couple of quick questions on, through you, Madam Chair. Um, on your slide uh, 30, Chris, about the HPA being responsible for any capital costs going forward, is it safe to say, Chris, that if this deal was not consummated with the Port Authority, and I, like Councillor Collins, want to thank uh, the new vision of the current Port Authority, both staff and the uh, Board of Directors, a number of them on that board who, are, who live and work in Hamilton and understand the dynamics of our city. Um, is it safe to say, Chris, if that wasn't consummated, that the costs in 5B would be uh, borne by the City of Hamilton entirely? Madam Chair, through you Chris. to Chris, please. Um, um, in, indirectly, yes. I, I guess the only caveat to that, to, to, to be fair, would be, I guess, depending on what other agreement that you made. So I, get, I guess in theory, if, uh, if we were to take it over as the city in 2015, as Councillor Collins uh, talked about, the, the way the initial deal is, is that in 2015 the marina comes back to us. If now all of a sudden it comes back to us, yes, that would be solely our, uh, our expense. So that re thanks, Madam Chair. That thank you, Chris. That reinforces my point of uh, this uh, multi-party and multi-component um, recommendation in uh, in consultation uh, with the Port Authority that uh, you're, you and staff are recommending, which I'm strongly supportive of. And in slide 32, Chris, going forward, again under item three, marina replacement, upgrade of slips uh, for the future, um, and without. Um, without holding you to any absolute guarantee today, but going forward under three, Madam Chair, again, if we support this, um, is the city uh, in line for any percentage of additional revenue that might come from expansion slips? If Chris can uh, Chris? answer that, Madam Chair, through you. Through you, Madam Chair, um, uh, the, yes. Uh, this is the slide here. Yes, in the agreement, it actually has a clause that allows for a uh, revenue sharing agreement on the expansion of the marina slips. Uh, we have not negotiated the actual clause, the actual amount, formula. It could take many different kind of ways, but the short answer is yes, that's in the MOU. Mr. Terrific, Jackson. Chris. Thanks, Madam Chair. And again, thanks to the Yacht Club who, um, in speaking to uh, Martin, who I saw earlier today, reminded me how they had originally come into the convention center in the last term of council about four years ago, and some of us had assured him that within a few months, I think we could uh, <laughs> have this kind of report before us, but Martin, patience is a virtue, and I appreciate that you're in the gallery today, recognizing that sometimes, especially in the public domain, things take time to get it right. And lastly, Chris, in 7.2C, where you talk about the capital funding, I get it through 2014, that's within this term of council, and I do support in principle going forward in the next term of council. Um, and just so that I've always been consistent in binding future councils, and I'm all for your C recommendation, but we want to just maybe put in a word or two, possibly that 15 beyond, uh, maybe the word forecasting in principle, just so that the future terms of council could be updated at the appropriate time, but that's not at all to pull back on the momentum that you've put in that recommendation. Madam Chair, I'm so strongly supportive of this, and thanks to all the community partners that Chris has recognized. Without them, we couldn't do this. And Councillor Collins, and to his mum's credit, Councillor Shirley Collins back in the 80s got this vision a long time ago and, and all of us are catching up. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Jackson, do you want me to come back to you for that recommendation for a, an update? Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The, um, 
I actually had an interesting perspective as well. When I was working for David Kostovs, a special uh, advisor, that was after the Peterson cover went down, they had, in, I guess during the election, made a commitment, or prior to the election, made a commitment for $10 million for the LAX property for the cleanup and transformation. When the, the uh, NDP government took over, there was no dollars, there was no treasury, there was nothing, and uh, negotiation sessions uh, started, and that's when the $10 million uh, was provided by then the NDP government uh, for the transformation of the uh, LAX property. Then I also had the, the, the privilege and opportunity when I was the Chief of Staff for Bob Morrill uh, when the lawsuit was launched. And uh, just for context for the viewers and, 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 and some of the new members around this council chamber, the port lands, the port, the port lands were actually our city-owned lands and were requests uh, back, I can't remember what the year it was now, but 1800s, 1900s, probably not early 1900s, uh, had asked the federal government uh, to create a, a port authority for shipping and navigation purposes. Uh, and the idea was that any uh, surplus revenue from those activities would come back to the city. As it turned out, I don't think the city received over the 100 years or whatever it was, one cent of profit from the port authority. Uh, they kept reinvesting in, 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 the, uh, in the port, but certainly the city didn't uh, reap any additional dollars from it other than taxes or so forth, employment. So the lawsuit was launched because obviously there was lands that uh, uh, prevented access to the waterfront uh, and were not being utilized for shipping and navigation purposes, which is the prime role for the Port Authority. Marina was one of those issues that was always a concern. And I remember having uh, in the negotiations, the idea was that the Port Authority would be, and I remember, not only the negotiations, but the whole concept of what a port authority's responsibilities are and uh, a mandate. So having that history, I guess a couple concerns are raised. And if Councillor Jackson asked a good question, my answer to him would be, uh, I, I'm not a guy that loves monopolies. Uh, we have uh, the ownership of these lands. Yes, there's a history with the Port Authority in regards to marinas. My opinion is Port Authority should be running marinas. Uh, maybe my, maybe I'm on my own, but I think I've heard that from through the, all these discussions, through the negotiations. And we've never tested the market to determine if we could do better in the context of the operation of the marina and amenities, and et cetera. So without having that opportunity, it's hard to imagine if we're getting a great deal. I guess the other side, and I think this is the, the, the point that some councillors around this table have made, but we're moving up the, 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 the overall agenda to, to meet the, uh, the targets of setting sail. So I guess uh, um, I was a little bit reluctant to accept that because, I, again, I don't like monopolies. I like to have a, an open process in regards to the operation of a marina that are rightfully lands that are, are scheduled to come back into uh, the city's hands. When was the actual time that the marina was supposed to come into the city's hands? Chris? Three. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, 2015. 2015, so in another two years. Now we've extended, as a result of this agreement, we're, we're, we're extending the Port Authority's operation for what, 20 years? Chris? Uh, through, through you, Madam Chair, um, 25 years, but I just want to make sure that we're clear. We're not extending the lease on the lands for 25 years, which they currently have till 2015. So it, it's solely the operation of the marina. It's a nuance there, but it's a really critical nuance in the fact that we control the actual land. They will be operating the marina. Uh, this agreement gives them the operational right to operate the marina for 25 years, but they do not retain the lease of the lands themselves. Thus, the reason why we can then use this to, to potentially develop in the boat storage relocation clause. Councillor Whitehead. And as a result of that, then we've moved up the timelines. Chris? Through Madam Chair, yes. I, I mean, it, the essence of this deal is that, uh, that you, you, uh, you are um, allowing the Port Authority the right to operate the marina for 25 years, and I'm being really general here, uh, in return for the fact that the city uh, gets the, all the lands back today uh, with no lease to the Hamilton Port Authority and allows our ability to then implement uh, uh, all the plans that have been amassed over the years. Councillor Whitehead. Okay, but uh, so help me understand this, and they still have a requirement for the operation of arenas in regards to the general uh, uh, 
geography of, uh, of the operation of the marina. So what does it actually free up in regards to our own plans? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, wish I, I don't think I have a, a map here. Um, it, there's, a, there's a map that's in the original letter of understanding that's actually, I, I believe, your Appendix B. Map on the back clearly shows what lands are, are, are allocated to what. Uh, the agreement clearly lays that out. The management agreement will as well. Solely will be the lands relating to operating the buildings, the, the, the docks, the, uh, the, the ability to get from land to water, but it does not contain the actual lands themselves. So for instance, going back to the rec master plan, I guess maybe the easiest way to visualize it, at the foot of James, if we were to walk down there right now, you'd probably see a whole bunch of boats stored there. Um, that will continue to be the case until we figure out the boat relocation, but those lands and the ability for, for that to happen is, is what this is in the city's control, not in the Port Authority's control. Today, it's leased to them. It's their, their control of those lands. Councillor Whitehead, just for the record, Appendix B does not have a map. Appreciate it. So can I ask, um, and I've had this uh, off, uh, uh, um, discussion as well, offline discussion as well. Um, there's some incredible visionaries uh, uh, out there in here in regards to the potential of the waterfront. And I think that's what this is all about. I think Councillor Collins uh, did a very eloquent speech on it. Um, and we're only limited by our imaginations. Um, I guess my concern uh, as a boater, quite frank, now I'm going to speak as a boater, is uh, the, currently the, the, the amenities, uh, when I want to go and, uh, and visit a restaurant or partake in festivities along the waterfront, it's not all that welcoming for the, for the, uh, uh, the daytime recreational boat users. And uh, it concerns me because it's a growing market, whether it's the sea dew tours, or sorry, I call them sea dews, I'm, that's showing my age, the, uh, what do they call the jet ski, uh, 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 you see huge amounts of these tours, organized tours, uh, going from port to port, city to city. Uh, you're seeing a lot of recreational uh, boats again, and, and as we continue expanding um, the amenities and, and the opportunities on our waterfront, uh, we're going to generate, obviously, road traffic, which is being clearly talked about in the, in the setting sail plan, but really haven't talked about uh, what kind of boat traffic it may generate in regards to becoming a destination location. So I'm trying to understand, uh, when we're looking at these kinds of agreements, are we hiving off a percentage of, um, I, I, I'm not sure what the terminology is, but uh, 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 hourly uh, type, just like a parking lot for cars, uh, for those recreational, might come from Port Credit or St. Catharines or whatever to come in and enjoy the many things that we're building on the waterfront. Are we building in, because uh, if we don't have that capacity and create that capacity or that commitment, what we do is basically uh, eliminate that whole opportunity. So I need to understand clearly how that component is built into this plan. Chris? So uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, uh, this is all a new version of, uh, of everything here, so I'm trying to, I think some of this, so, so a couple different questions there, let me see if I can kind of, you know, hit, hit the right, uh, hit the right kind of notion. Uh, um, on uh, this slide here, um, am I got it right? Number 13 is actually in the 2013 capital budget. We are actually uh, uh, doing a project right now uh, that's in the implementation stage to create a transient dock uh, style outlet just outside of the, the fresh uh, cafe and the scoops ice cream kind of area. And that's what that, 20, that's what that number 13 uh, capital plan is. It's actually funded in the 2013 budget and is actually being implemented. As it relates to the broader, and, and this is where these things all kind of work together, um, and, and that the deal itself, uh, and I apologize, I wish I could kind of... In the end of the day, we're just trying to implement what Council's already endorsed. The REC Master Plan, this is the area here that we're talking about. In the end of the day, the REC Master Plan calls for what I call a piazza. I'm not sure exactly what, the, what it was called before. But this is a retail, restaurants, 
amenity type place that's lacking right now. And but the difference is, right now, this is where the boats are stored. And that's why what we're trying to do here, and that's why the importance of what I tried to do in the first lead up, in the, in the update of the presentation, is the things all work consecutively. Until we, we have control over the lands on Pier 7 and 8, it's very difficult to move any of this stuff forward. And so it's about one step at a time. To the token of, of, of monopoly, I, we, 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 in the end of the day, negotiated a, a deal uh, that we thought is fair on both sides, um, and, and that's what we're, we're kind of presenting you today. We took what was on the table. We took the, the, the areas that each party was kind of looking at from a business case perspective, and we've presented it to, to you today. So can I ask then, uh, who's going to be operating? Is it part of the Port Authority's uh, um, mandate to take those transient docks that you talked about that we're building into the plan? I think, I think Outdoor city? wanted to kick in there, Terry, if you can, yes, over. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Whitehead. Uh, there's two areas of transient docking being planned in there, to your point uh, earlier in uh, another presentation. So there's a Pier 7 little piece that Chris uh, Phillips just showed you as well into the agreement with the Hamilton Port Authority. There will be a provision in there that must provide for transient docking, which is what you're referring to, uh, for daily parking that uh, you don't have to belong to the club or whatever, and they're going to have to have a certain percentage of transient docks available. Great. Um, and I guess the... Uh Um, the concept I've always supported uh, and all the good work and I, I want to commend Councillor uh, Collins because I think right from the get-go uh, he, he grabbed the uh, reins of this one and uh, and uh, been doing his due diligence to work with staff and the sailing sail and and uh, eventually the Waterfront Trust uh, to to try and see that vision in, uh, implemented and, and I was a bit reluctant because again 25 years is a long term management operating agreement. Normally it's five years, you've got renewal, only five years, you've got a chance to re, uh, review, and you can make a determination if the Port Authority's operation is in fitting with your overall uh, operation and, 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 and vision, because you're locked in for 25 years. So uh, I guess my question then is, uh, with all the potential and optimizing the performance of our waterfront, do we see any obstacles uh, with the type of arrangement that we've entered into with, or will be entering into with the, uh, the Port Authority uh, in making the appropriate adjustments to, again, optimize the performance of the waterfront? Through your Deputy Mayor, no, I don't think we see any obstacles in this particular thing. There's no doubt, as I explained earlier on, there's a, it's a complex area to, to redevelop. So it, it, this isn't going to just totally, you know, be, be easy that tomorrow it's going to look like that. But this agreement itself, there's no specific obstacles that we see in the agreement before you today that doesn't, that affects one, the marine operation going forward, or secondly, that affects our ability to kind of move forward. And like I said, from a staff perspective and through a negotiation perspective, we've presented you what we think is a, is a fair agreement. Like any other negotiation, um, you could kind of say, should we have had X versus Y? We made a determination as we kind of laid out uh, a rationale of why we think it's fair. Same thing with the other side. And big picture, we think it gets us going towards this in, in the ultimate day. And that's what we're trying to get to is the implementation aspect. I appreciate those. I mean, I, I just sort of raised some of the concerns, and I'm happy that at least it's envisioned and it's part of the, uh, uh, the envisioning because... Uh, I, I entered the uh, the, the uh, restaurant. Was it some uh, circo circos? Uh, the 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 circo, the the uh, patio, and that. I mean, you just know in the summertime, this is going to become one of the premium places on on the waterfront, and it will attract uh, over time with all the other menus we contemplate. Uh, a lot more recreational boating boaters come into this uh, area as a, a destination. So I really want, as a recreational boater. Uh, and again, a type of boat that's looking for the more transient docking facility because I pull my, you know, I leave my boat at home when I not when it's not in the water. And there's many that do. Uh, I want to make sure that opportunity isn't lost uh, with the overall vision or the sorry, the vision of the uh, the waterfront. 
And then lastly, Mr. Chair, I just want to again uh, commend uh, the leadership of uh, our staff, uh, Chris, incredible, incredible journey. And you continue to walk down this road, uh, my hats off to you and Al and, and all these others that uh, staff have mentioned. And certainly the city manager, because I, far too often, because I've been here for a fairly short time relative to my good colleague, Councillor Jackson, he's seen a few city managers. The, uh, the reality is, is that it's great to have a city manager that understands, appreciates, and becomes part of the team uh, to, to, to seek out these visions and, and see them implemented. Through his leadership and the great staff underneath him on this particular uh, uh, report, I want to commend all of you. Thank you. Councillor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And let me just first uh, start off by saying it's quite remarkable. My dad's first house was on, uh, on the West Harbour on Greg Street. And since um, that was in the mid-50s that he purchased that home. Having said that, it was an area where he worked to, to get out of, uh, basically. And now people are working to get into the West Harbour. So it's something that we uh, truly need to know. And I, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, to Chris Murray, I think the excitement and, uh, about this and the discussion that's been going on for so many years about, about uh, West Harbour and the setting sail plan, people are asking when, when is a shovel going to hit the ground, basically? And, uh, and through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Chris Murray, when, when do you think the public will see a, a lot of this development starting from a residential and commercial perspective that we're talking about here in the setting sail plan? So your, your question is to residential commercial, not necessarily to break water? That's correct, yes. Okay, Chris? Um, our, our goal is to, to see the progress, you know, get over the planning and the, you know, the detailed design and all that to get into uh, uh, real development uh, as we can start as early as next year and, and move forward. I mean, there's, you know, to this waterfront work that we're talking about here in the North End neighborhood, as you mentioned, Councillor, you know, I just want to mention that link this to what we've been talking about, about healthy neighborhoods. I mean, our goal here is to make sure that not only does it transform in the way in which you want and you see development next year taking place and then moving from there forward, um, you know, we want this area to be, you know, a showcase nationally uh, for what healthy neighborhood uh, revitalization looks like. So, um, you know, all the comments we've heard uh, you know, this morning have been, you know, greatly appreciated. Uh, we know there's an urgency to get on with it. And uh, that's why you got as many people focused on it because, you know, like you want, and, and we certainly are here to support. We want to make sure it happens in our lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, and you want to see it happen, uh, start happening this term, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Chris, uh, with respect to um, the, the, the parcels of land that we, the city, own, are we actively pursuing the sale and the development of those lands uh, presently? in any capacity. <clears throat> Chris? Through, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, yes, uh, in a, uh, it, sorry, uh, Councillor. Um, we are, and again, it's a bit of a process. And I want to, I think if we kind of go back to this, I think it'll be all about, you know, the different areas. Barton Tiffany will probably be kind of the one that you kind of see first that we could use as a as a launch pad. It's already assembled. We know what's there. Uh, it, it's a it's a large contiguous piece. We've done a bunch of the studies. The planning's all done. This could certainly go relatively quickly, say potentially by the end of the year or the first of next year type type thing. Um, the lands that we're talking about with Piers uh, uh, 7 and 8 specific to this particular MOU, probably it'd be a little longer term. But it's not to say that, that there can't be development that happens quicker. Right. So going back to the master plan, it's all not going to be built in one year, in one cycle. Right. It's a variety of different projects. And so what we're bringing back to you in the summer and kind of leading into the fall will be a very specific plan of attack and a phasing plan where you can see when the shovels can hit the ground and where the opportunities are for the private sector to come in and make their investments. And through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with respect to Barton and Tiffany, that's what I was visualizing, particularly when I asked that question, uh, are we going to an RFP process to basically set the parameters of the development? 
through through you, Deputy Mayor. We haven't uh, we haven't ascertained that yet, and I think part of our planning uh, in the design study will be to engage the broader community, both the development community, but also the broader community, as to what what is it uh, that that we should kind of look at through this. So I think what we can do is do a bit of a development plan through the urban design study process, so that then we figure out is the is the proper route to do an expression of an interest, an RFP, just sell it. We bring back though council options on that, and you'll see that before it goes out. Along the same lines of city motor and what the, the intended plan is there, what I'd like to see happen is that the request for proposal go out based on residential commercial type of development and see what the private sector has to offer, because I think, I actually know, there's going to be a significant amount of interest. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, you had mentioned that there might be something at the end of the year. Is that a hint that uh, that someone's biting right now on, on the proposal itself or the potential proposal? About Barton and Tiffany. Sorry, through Mr. Murray. Just, uh, I'll start, and I know Chris is uh, having similar to there, there are calls into my office. I know there's calls into planning economic development. There is no lack of interest from developers from Toronto onwards to Hamilton in this area. Both uh, uh, the Barton Tiffany area, Piers 7 and 8, and, and other locales within this whole area. So um, this will not be very difficult to get uh, a number of parties to respond. Okay. And uh, so and Chris can sorry. add to that. Sorry, sorry, three years. Uh, I guess this council has been planning a long time. We just, we'd like to see a shovel on the ground. Yeah, the three I'd like to, yeah, yesterday rather than tomorrow. But having said that, we are moving in the right direction. Barton and Tiffany is on my mind at this point. I'm glad to see there's a lot of interest. I think that's something the public needs to hear and wants to hear. But also, if over and above that, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Chris Murray or Chris Phillips, either one, with respect to other parcels of land, even outside of the West Harbour area, for potential development of either a rec uh, or commercial or residential types of setting, are, are, do we have an inventory of all that land, and are we are we actively pursuing uh, interest within that land, within that process? That's a question to who? To Chris Murray, I guess. Chris Murray. Um, there is uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the short answer is that uh, uh, this is one of these situations where we don't have to drag anyone to uh, to a meeting to get them to express an interest in this part of Hamilton. So, um, you know, there are. You know there are a number of developers that are that are inquiring and have been inquiring over the last couple of years. The fact that you've got the OMB decision on setting sail just means that there's a very real focus right now on this area. We know what it is that needs to be done. We have approval to do it. We're going to bring back the phasing to you. Uh, and as and I think in that that presentation you're going to see later this year uh, in the summer, early fall. Um, any other opportunities that are starting to materialize, we will bring to you then so that you can see exactly uh, just what the heat looks like in this area. Wonderful. And, and lastly, whether it be uh, New York or Chicago or any major center throughout <laughs> North America, one thing that's for certain is that they're reversing the trend of moving lower income housing and the industry to the water and reversing that by bringing higher end type of developments. And, and we're no different. It's unfortunate that it's been delayed to some degree, but I'm glad that we're on the right track and we are moving in the right direction. But as I mentioned earlier, we, I'd like to see this sooner rather than later. And I'm glad to see there's interest regarding Barton and <coughs> Tiffany. I know that's been a long-standing uh, issue here in the city. Uh, having said that, the fact that there's a lot of interest and something might be coming or will be coming in the near future is something I think the public uh, is going to be uh, happy to hear about. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Deputy. you. Councilor Morelli. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, my comments, uh, I won't repeat what's been said. I certainly want to thank everyone uh, that's been involved in the, the, the harbor. Clearly, it's the one project I, I've always said that I've never met any resistance from anyone uh, that's, uh, that's been down there and certainly sees how this thing is moving forward. I want to thank Chris today for the report, certainly thank staff. You know, it's kind of funny. Some of the people were talking about the history. I wrote the first, uh, 1973, I wrote the, uh, the report for Cabinet, uh, which dealt with that property. And uh, it was the lax property that led to everything from the Harbor Gate uh, uh, issues that existed, uh, if you go back in media. And I still have those reports, by the way, if anyone wants to see them. But the histories uh, of the Dell Hickeys, the Joe Alonzas, uh, the Ken Elliots, the Pat Dillons, all those that subsequently went through. Uh, and even how the Lax property evolved and came about by virtue of building the Claremont. 
and, uh, and how that all worked. Uh, bottom line was that there's been visions for many years as to what was ultimately going to happen there. But more importantly, uh, and that's 1972-73 when I worked <coughs> for Cabinet. So I can tell you that uh, when I look at that, I can't help but be excited, uh, and, and I want to make that point today. I, even when we talk about the, uh, the private individuals, Gil Simmons, who uh, also was, uh, you know, from a public perspective and a, and a citizen perspective, is incredibly, deserves so much credit uh, for the orientation and the focus that we're accomplishing today, and, and that's not... Uh, taken away any of the credit for the work that's 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 been done here and, and will continue to be done, I'm sure. Um, I remember working with the Ministry of Transport and the Port Authority and understanding how Hamilton has its own Port Act, and it's really quite different from the rest of, of, of Canada, quite frankly. And, and, and the fact that we're accomplishing this within that that type of silo is, is a, um, a major, uh, I think, accomplishment. In fact, uh, you know, I really don't want to ever lose sight of the fact that a number of us were involved in the appointment of the last uh, citizen member to the port. And at that time, I remember very specifically, which leads to my one point that I, I want to take advantage of today, is, is that one of the, the challenges that I continue to have uh, with this, this piece of property, and it's only a matter of, uh, of, of the fact that it's, it's the most gorgeous entrance into the city of Hamilton when you look at the West End. I mean, I, I've returned home from many places throughout this world. And I can tell you, it was always a pleasure to drive in on, uh, over the high-level bridge and certainly later on the 403. But, you know, you don't always see what, what the beauty of what we're developing there. And quite frankly, it's, it's a challenge for me because uh, where a lot of the traffic e e emanates is in the east end. And somehow, you know, and Chris has heard me talk about this, but somehow we've got to find a way if we want to continue to export our community in terms of bringing people to it, uh, we need to find a way to hook into taking advantage of all the traffic that flows over that that bridge and sees what this community is all about and, and certainly gets the correct picture. Now, I, I saw you talk about Confederation today, but even Confederation, it's not not that difficult to fly by and not always see it. So it's a terrific resource, enough to make us make sure that the stadium never went there. But I can tell you that that I think we need to to... As part of today, I certainly want to leave the message that I hope that we will continue, you know, to look at the East End is how we hook it in to attract people to recognize uh, what you have in, 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 in this terrific development. In fact, even when you sit uh, down there at Sarkoa on the outback deck, um, you can't really see around the corner. Those, if you've been in the, if you've been on water or land, you can't always see what's happening in, in the West Harbor. And somehow we have to, um, we have to find a way to make sure that we, we promote this because this, this is probably one of the best economic engines along with the airport and that we always talk about in terms of driving this community economically. And so I, I really want to make that point today. Uh, uh, Councillor um, Marula talks about the Bart and Tiffany area and some of our frustrations by the fact that the stadium didn't, didn't go there. And I can tell you this much, it's still going to be, if we're smart and we, we really think this thing through, that'll probably be the best, most valuable piece of property that we have in this whole community if we develop it and it'll pay for itself uh, ten times over, in my opinion. So uh, I want to just make those comments uh, today and, and then somehow leave uh, uh, staff who are working so well with this as it takes a, even a greater focus uh, with, the, with the idea that we can't ignore, we shouldn't ignore the East End as an opportunity to not only develop, I remember, I remember looking at the original maps in 1972 and 73 where that East End was going to be prestige industries. If you go back and look at the Port Authority drawings and the, the uh, under the, the Ministry of Transport in, um, and I remember the, the guy's name was Bert Cavey at the uh, Department of Transport in Ottawa, when we sat and it was going to be all prestige industries. And you know, of course, when you look there now and you've got these tar facilities and parked res recreational vehicles, it's far from being very pre prestige, but we can, I think, work with that. We can still get around that and, and exploit that. And I think that'll create the, uh, the complete picture for, 
you know, helping us export our, our economy. So I wanted to make those comments today and thank you for the opportunity to, to do that and to express my gratitude as well to everyone involved uh, in, in, in the current circumstance and, and presentations and work and recognize fully, I think, uh, picking up on Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Jackson's comments, there's a lot of people previous to the work that we're doing today that really had a significant role, though the, the Collinses and the, the, the Monroes and, and, and those people that, 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 that saw the vision early on, and obviously not to this extent, but certainly uh, I'm sure they're looking down and saying in some cases that uh, this is really great and uh, good work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have no other speakers, so can I have a motion then to receive the presentations for both 7 1 and 7 2? Pearson and Johnson, all in favor? Carried. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Councillor Jackson, you have an amendment. So thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So <coughs> in consultation with Acting GM Mike Segarek and Eldor under C part, after the word approved, uh, put in the words in principle throughout two th and then carry on throughout 2014, 15, 16, 17 capital budgets. And after the word budgets with a staff reporting back on a financing strategy in 2013. Seconded by Council Collins, discussion on the amendment. No comments from staff? Okay, all in favor? Carry. Okay, well, I also need uh, an amendment to add subsection F to remove this item from the outstanding business list. Can somebody move that call in? Seconded by Pasuda. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. Councillor Johnson, do you want to move the main motion or do you have something uh, yeah, else? Yeah, I do, but I also wanted to add on B part that the mayor and the city manager. That's a good point. I was going to come to that, but that's a good point. So okay, you're moving so that, amendment. Move that amendment. That that's the on mayor part B and that the, the mayor city and manager. city manager be authorized. Seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Uh, Councillor uh, Johnson, you're moving the main motion? Yeah. Oh, Councillor Collins is seconding it or do you want to move it? I think no. Okay. I'll Councillor Collins. Moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Johnson. Discussion, any further discussion on the main motion? All in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you. Uh, I think we should finish the presentations before we go to any break because I know that yeah. the HEC-5 transition team is here. So at this time I'd like to call on John Hertel to provide the presentation on item 7.3, which is the HEC-5 transition update. John, welcome back to the council chambers. Even think the No, 17 final. MGSC update, 17th. Third one up. No? This is uh, advanced. No, I guess it's this one here. Okay. Great. Okay. John, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, join you today for uh, a brief update. Uh, it just seemed uh, very timely that uh, about six weeks in, uh, I should come in person perhaps to give you a brief update and answer any questions. And then it was my thought that on an ongoing basis, say roughly once per quarter, to provide uh, more of a, a written uh, update uh, for your perusal. And then only when there is uh, any uh, urgent item would I then come back uh, in person except for uh, year end when we would have gone through the first uh, transition year and report back then uh, financially. I do have a couple of transition colleagues, uh, Brian McMullen and uh, Rick DeFilippo here uh, in case we have any uh, finance questions uh, beyond my uh, level and uh, we'll look forward to the update. Uh, I wanted to mention that the uh, transition team has approached this on the basis of looking forward to facilitating success of the new operators. And that might be in, in contrast to seeing ourselves strictly as a watchdog uh, for the management contracts. So our, our motto essentially for each of the two operators is how can we help you be successful. 
Uh, we want to make sure, obviously, that the ROI is maximized for taxpayers, that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the community mandates that were built into the management contracts are fulfilled, and certainly that the, uh, the city and probably the downtown area more specifically sees the economic stimulation that everyone had hoped would come through this uh, project. The first six weeks, as you can imagine, have been uh, pretty hectic for the operators and the uh, staff uh, in place and those who've been added to the team by their proponents. Um, there's no real number to this. It's a, a scale of volume. Uh, and you have to picture, uh, literally effective March the 1st, that the proponents came into bookings that were solid and, and busy. So on, on day one and two, they're executing events. Uh, we worked closely with them, provided uh, some overlap in staff, et cetera, to get through the first ones. But realistically, all of the events that you would have seen in town over the last six weeks were events that were already booked. So they're inheriting those, they're inheriting the commitments made, uh, the relationships with the clients, uh, suppliers, et cetera. So it's busy time. Um, this has been, uh, I would call it more of a firefighting stage in the sense that we're reacting to uh, challenges, meeting extremely frequently. And then I'm hoping that the majority of these kind of uh, one-off uh, items are, are really put to bed towards the end of May and that everything that we're doing beyond that point is much more on the proactive planning stage, again, helping to uh, ensure success. From a governance point of view, we have uh, organized uh, really two levels of uh, governance. One is more of a, uh, a short-term monitoring around the facilities, the operations, capital budgets, et cetera, facilities management team. We'll meet monthly. We've met, I'd say, a little bit less formally on a very regular basis so far, but we now have these meetings scheduled out for the balance of the year. And on a, a sort of a slightly higher level uh, of oversight, we have a, a senior level team from the proponents and ourselves put in place to actually manage and monitor the contract compliance. Uh, we'll be having our first meeting in the month of May, it's uh, scheduled, and then we'll meet quarterly uh, from that point on. Uh, on the financial side, which of course is a very significant driver behind the entire project, uh, we have had a skeleton staff of our business services people under Rick's uh, leadership stay on board to help with the really three major areas of the transition. One is uh, working with the new operators to transition all of the financial activities uh, that they needed to them. Of course, they all have uh, quite different systems, uh, softwares, etc. Uh, we're working very, very closely with city staff the auditors to close out both year end and to also conclude and wrap up uh, year end, if you will, at the end of February as well. So uh, extremely busy there. Uh, and together uh, with uh, city staff, we're building all of the tracking mechanisms that will help us monitor the financials and all the activities throughout the life of these contracts. On the other side of the slide for capital budgets, that's of course a, a very major uh, item and one if you visualize time of year uh, being in the middle of uh, April, the window of opportunity for the vendors, or excuse me, the proponents to really get work done uh, uh, is this summer. So right now is a very, very busy time on this front as we try to understand exactly uh, what the priorities are, the money is available from both the city and the proponents, uh, building a plan to execute as much as possible that creates a, a tremendous impact, we hope, sort of the kickoff of the fall season. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is not uh, new information, but just to repeat, uh, at this point in time, uh, 28 people uh, receive severances. You'll see the, uh, the breakout there. Um, and I just wanted to make note also that as we're going through the, uh, the final uh, severance discussions with all the individuals, that you know the numbers are not yet known in terms of the dollars and cents. But just a small point that there are a couple of people who may get added to the list ultimately because there's one person uh, on maternity leave, another person on uh, sick leave. So theoretically, this could end up being 30, not to 28. Uh, employees retained, um, obviously, uh, all of the union uh, personnel are retained, plus the non-union part-time. Uh, and I didn't mention on this slide, but also, of course, the full-time union personnel, of which there are 14, uh, 11 from uh, IOUE 772 uh, and three from IATSE 129. They, of course, are retained. 
And I, I did uh, incorrectly indicate 13, it's actually 14 uh, have been hired by Global Spectrum, so my apologies for that. Nine full-time non-union, and uh, really pleased for five formerly part-time people who were brought on uh, and hired as full-time. Uh, in addition, the, uh, we have found uh, positions for three people in total at this point in time uh, who are transferred into roles uh, within the city. Last slide, uh, you know, a number of things we've experienced, and I, I know some of you were involved in a few of the uh, occasions. So we had a few initial uh, payroll and benefits uh, hiccups, which have been uh, cleared. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of the uh, management contract with regards to the 11 people who form uh, the team for IOUE 772, their work, uh, it was scheduled and, and uh, event driven, if you will, across the three venues. So it, it was not possible to separate them into 100% dedicated to any venue. So we've left them as a team. They report to and they're employees of Global Spectrum. Then they're scheduled to do the work uh, across. Other. So it's some initial scheduling difficulties are getting through as well. Uh, Laura Fontana and uh, Legal Etc. continue to work with all the uh, individuals to finalize their settlements. And of course, I remain as uh, kind of a focal point for any uh, one-off uh, issues and challenges and uh, help the, uh, the teams to resolve those. And that's my very quick update and I would welcome any uh, questions or clarification. Okay, reverse Councillor Johnson and then Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And good afternoon, John. Thank you for your presentation. Can you please go back to the slide where you're talking about capital projects, please? Yes. Thank you. And you said right from the very get-go, this is a very important issue. Uh, building condition assessments are complete. Were there any surprises? Or is there something that we all knew all along that needed to be done and we're already um, budgeted for? Yeah, in fact, uh, the positive news, uh, thank you for that question, is that <clears throat> the building assessments um, look at a very high level, uh, kind of structural, et cetera, and because of the uh, really good maintenance programs that have been in place, most of the major items have had extended life. The roof at Cops Coliseum is a great example. It probably uh, should have been, according to the assessments, uh, replaced a year or two ago. But we've been able to, through a little bit of repair, extend the life out. So what we're doing right now through uh, Rome D'Angelo and team yeah. is reviewing the building assessments against uh, capital maintenance programs and, if you will, redefining uh, some of the life of these projects so that the first step before we can contribute to any of the uh, more cosmetic things that the proponents would like done, we need to ensure that we've got monies in place to uh, maintain the structural integrity and other, you know, keep capital components first. Thank you for that um, answer. And just through you, one more question. Uh, you were saying we have to make sure we have that money before... Um, we have that money in, in place. Do we have the money in place right now to take care of the structural problems? Uh, our budgeting. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. We believe that we do uh, in the sense that there is uh, there's still some uh, unspent uh, WIP accounts and reserves from last year. There is the budget uh, from this year plus the commitment from um, uh, specifically from both the proponents in you know quite different ways. But we think that uh, we've got enough money to help do the cosmetic things this summer, uh, not everything of course, but also uh, to kind of squirrel away some money uh, as needed for the roof repair or replacement, that sort of thing. Thank you, John. That's what I was looking for, that we weren't having any big surprises on the horizon, that we wouldn't have to go into the levy. And, and so that's overall, it's good sound news. I Great. appreciate that. Thank you. Professor Pearson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor and John. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad that this is coming back quarterly as, uh, as an update because it's great to see the positives. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of work with regards to the previous question, a lot of work was done on especially the convention facility part while we were over there as a matter of fact when we were doing our uh, meetings when this building was being renovated. So right. a lot of upgrades are done then. But my question to you is you mentioned at the beginning that the, the, the performances and the acts, they had quite a number that had already been booked and they're going in with uh, continuation of booking. So how do they, how do we stand in that stead? And obviously they're trying to fill in the, the vacant slots now, correct? Yes, it's uh, through you, Mr. Chair. 
uh, it's probably a good generalization to say that the events that you have seen and will see until summer, uh, and in some cases beyond and even into uh, you know the next couple of years on the convention center side, were booked and in place. And the proponents are working hard now at really trying to build up the back half of the year. Okay, I have no more questions. I have a motion to receive the presentation. Moved by Pearson, second by Johnson. All in favor? Yeah. And we Thank need a motion the then to uh, uh, receive the report. Pearson, Pursuta, all in favor? Carried. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, we've got three choices now. We can take a half hour break now. We can hear the last presentation, which is Paul Johnson, or we can skip a break and just keep right on going. What's your wish? We can, we can shift off out to have lunch then. Is that, what, is that the consensus? Just keep going for the rest of the day. Councilor McCaddy. Mr. Chair, just so you know, I've got a cable 14 for the record uh, event, so I've got to leave at 2.30 uh, just in terms of your quorum. Is anybody here uh, opposed to not taking a break? Okay. I'm going to be gone by three. Exactly. That's what I'm going to do. There was, there was nobody that uh, wanted to take a break, so we'll now call on Paul Johnson to come up and uh, provide the presentation with respect to <laughs> item 7.4. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor and uh, members of committee. Carolyn. It's my pleasure to stand uh, before you today and, and bring you an update on where we stand with the relaunch of our citizen engagement project focused on city services. I'm going to take you through a number of slides to talk about our approach and, uh, and, and tell you where we're at and, and assuming no further direction from yourselves, we would uh, begin to implement this, uh, this plan as is before you today. But I want to highlight a few things just as, as context before I start. One is everything that you see here works within the existing budget that we had on this project and continue to have on this project. Secondly, it delivers our plan on the original goals. Uh, thirdly, it builds on the previous work that was already completed, so this was not a complete restart of this project. And finally, it will involve local businesses and volunteers in a larger way to help us get through to the fruition of this project. So we assembled a staff team following the, uh, the, the mutual agreement to end the contract with Dialogue Partners to uh, look at how we would move forward. And I've put the names on this slide for you uh, to indicate again the kind of support we're seeing from across the corporation to help move forward with this project. Uh, Mike Kirkopoulos is providing a leadership role in terms of our communication. Angela Parle is providing a leadership role in coordinating this project. Uh, Janet Robinson is, is providing a leadership role in engagement. And John Murray is providing a leadership role around reporting. Uh, others, uh, Allison and Kelly and myself and Colleen Van Burkle are providing support. And Colleen has been particularly helpful in uh, developing an evaluation strategy for both the work that was previously done on this project and the work going forward. Forward. It's also important to recognize that we will be getting support internally for the web portion of this project. And I just want to let uh, the committee know that the web page for the, uh, the, the new uh, relaunch of this initiative will be a City of Hamilton internal website. There was some concerns, of course, about the web presence and uh, some security issues with that. Uh, this web work in the coming uh, days and weeks and months on this will be a City of Hamilton web presence. So here are the guidelines that we used as a group and as a team in looking at how to reposition this work and move forward. We wanted to build on the work that's already been completed. We wanted to focus even more so on education around city services. We've always had a commitment to expanding our capacity as a city around engagement. We wanted to streamline the approach because we did realize that we needed to deliver this within the approved budget. And also one uh, slight change is that this will be a completely City of Hamilton branded uh, project because we will be uh, primarily driving this work in an internal basis. The audience for the engagement project is all Hamiltonians and all Hamiltonians will be encouraged to participate. 
We will use specific approaches to encourage participation by individuals and groups that have been underrepresented uh, in previous engagement activities, but the, ac the audience remains the same. We'd like to hear from as many people across the city as possible about their experiences with city services and uh, also to give us a bit of a sense about how we can better engage in the future around important discussions of the services that we provide. Our approach in terms of entering into these conversations is to reinforce that this, this work we're doing, talking about the services that we provide, is linked to our strategic plan. Not only do we want to build a strong, prosperous community, we want to ensure that our governance and the services that we deliver are top-notch, that we're not doing things that we should potentially be getting out of the business of, and the things that we do do are very responsive to citizens' needs. So I think a piece that we want to spend more time talking about is how this work on engagement and this work on talking about our services is particularly related to our strategic plan. We want to utilize our existing corporate communications infrastructure as a way of communicating both the opportunities for participation, but also to uh, spread the word about what we do as a city, the very complex nature of running a municipality, as well as the opportunities for engagement and feedback. We are committed in this process, uh, should you feel the same today, to do some pre-launch work with sp specific uh, stakeholders in the community. These would be facilitated conversations about how we can accomplish what we want to accomplish better together. These would include external parties, uh, some of whom, of course, were very interested in the engagement pr process that we launched, but of course didn't launch in the way that we had hoped to. This would also include our own staff teams that have much to say about the way we should be communicating and positioning this work. We want opportunities for people to engage online, in print, and in person. The tools may be very similar, but there will be opportunities for people to participate in groups, but also do work on their own, online, if that suits their, their particular circumstance. We need you to be project ambassadors, and I'll talk a little bit about your role at the end of this presentation, because we want to ensure that residents are engaged from each ward. A piece of work that we uh, need to complete as a, as a city is the establishment of a policy around citizen engagement moving forward. And we propose in our approach that we do this collaboratively with staff and residents of this community to develop a proposal for discussion that would then come back to this committee. We talked much uh, during the period of time where we were discussing what to do with the Dialogue Partners contract. We talked about building staff capacity through training and we want to continue that commitment. This process is about engaging uh, uh, people in a discussion about services here at the City of Hamilton, and the participants who respond uh, to this, this request for engagement will be responding to questions about all our city services, our human services, and our infrastructure. Services are going to be clustered into categories that make sense to residents, and information about the services will be provided for each cluster so that we can impart some of the education that is so critical in this work. We're going to be asking uh, participants to reflect on the importance of the service for them personally and the importance of those services for the community as a whole. It's not just the personal values we need to know about services, it's also those collective values. But we also want to know some quantitative facts about the quality of services, the capacity of services to meet their needs, and importantly, where additional investments are required and how that investment should be funded. We also want to know a bit about gaps and potential uh, for improvements or new things, or perhaps things that the city is doing now that some residents feel maybe we should be get, get out of the business of. One of the pieces that we discussed as a staff team was that we needed participants to indicate if they did not feel that they had enough information to provide feedback. That in many cases, uh, there may be services for which we're asking residents to respond about how they feel about those services when we haven't done a strong enough job around education. But it's tough to know where those are. We can guess at them, but we want to actually get that feedback so that we can then in the future, as a, as a corporation, provide better information, targeted information, about specific areas of our work as a corporation that A, we feel proud about, and B, we think more people should know about. The development of this public engagement policy is a distinct piece of work that will go on uh, for, we think, more time than the specific engagement activity around services. So I've put it together a slide just to highlight how we see that happening. 
We'd like to, to uh, develop an advisory committee of citizens and of staff who would work collaboratively to talk about what needs to be in a policy for this uh, corporation in terms of citizen engagement. We need to develop a terms of reference. We need to put a call out for people to join us in that exercise. And this is, again, another way that passionate people about engagement can be involved in the work of the city. I received many emails through January, and a lot of them were, uh, uh, were angry emails. But in the midst of those emails were also a, a, an opportunity and an invitation for them to participate. They were hoping, hoping for an invitation to participate in the future in building a stronger approach to engagement. The goal would be we'd have a policy that would work, work for us as a city and work for the residents that we serve. So what will we learn through the engagement process around city services? We like to focus in on rating of the city services. How do people feel on various scales about individual baskets of services that we provide? We want to understand a little bit better where to prioritize investments. We need feedback on where more information is required, and we'd like to capture some qualitative data as well, of course, the experiences that people have, but we want to make sure that there's quantitative data. We need to understand where this feedback is coming from, who is providing it to us, what do they look like, and do they reflect the city of Hamilton? We'd love to be able to map out the data by wards so that we can see if there's differences between different areas of the city. We also want to evaluate this process. We will have to make some investments externally to get this work completed. One of those investments is to complete the staff training around uh, the International Association for Public Participation Certificates in Public uh, uh, Engagement. We want to complete this training and it was something that we did talk about through January and February with you. We want to make sure that our public engagement is inclusive and so we are going to be looking at some targeted requests for quotations to local firms to help us facilitate the larger emphasis on face-to-face -face engagement. One of the groups that we do want to work with specifically is the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. They have hosted some uh, successful conversation cafes in this community already. We want to build on that successful model and engage uh, individuals from our diverse communities in this important conversation. The questions, the things that we're gathering will be the same, but we know for certain populations there may be new ways that we can do this work together. We will have to invest in some advertising so that our residents can figure out how to get in touch with the materials and how to get in touch with the engagement sessions. And one of the ideas that came out of the fray in January uh, were a number of people coming forward and saying, you know, there's students at our post-secondary institutions that would love to become involved in this. They'd love to build capacity. Quite frankly, they'd love to build a bit of a resume. And they'd like to participate in their city. And we said, what a wonderful idea. We're proposing that we build student teams that through the summer would go out and build awareness around the engagement that will happen in the fall. That these student teams would receive some education around effective citizen engagement and that they would be ambassadors for the large scale engagement that will happen in September and October. We're still working through the model of how we would work with these students. Some of it would be a voluntary commitment and some of it would be an investment of resources towards their education. We'll figure out those details, but use of students would be part of the process. We have a lot of actions that will be delivered now internally. Our communication function will be de uh, delivered internally, both the online, in-print, and in-person pieces. The engagement planning and logistics will happen internally. So we will be booking the venues and looking after the logistics of bringing people to these discussions. The staff engagement component will be an internal conversation. We do want to ask our staff how they feel about the services that we deliver as a city. The web page, as I mentioned, will be an internal piece, as will data management, and of course the accountability of the overall project is an internal component now. Report writing will happen through John Murray and his team, and the evaluation of this exercise will occur through public health and the leadership of Colleen Van Berkel. Here are some of our desired outcomes. We obviously want to look at this report card uh, way of, of, of providing feedback to you around what citizens are saying, along with larger uh, written materials around the qualitative pieces of the content. We have an outcome goal of greater awareness and knowledge of the breadth and depth of city services. 
We do want a shared process of developing an engagement policy, and we certainly want to increase our staff engagement capacity. In the future, we want to do more of this engagement through the good work of the, uh, the staff here at the City of Hamilton. We're very good at it. And you can go through a long list of projects in, this, uh, in the city where the engagement has been done extremely well. So the question of evaluation, why evaluate, is answered in these bullet points. And we thought it was important that with this relaunch, we recommit to the evaluation of this, of this uh, project. We want to do a two-part evaluation. One is to look back on what happened. The Our Voice, Our Hamilton component of this project requires us to do an evaluation. We all know what happened publicly in those early days of January of this year. But there was an awful lot of work behind the Our Voice, Our Hamilton. And we need to understand more than just the very public piece that occurred earlier this year. The second piece of the evaluation is how we do with this new form of, uh, of engagement that we're, uh, that we're going out to do. And understand the effectiveness of the tools that we use and also under understand the usefulness of the feedback that we receive. One of the questions we have had is just what will we do and what can we do with the information that comes back? Is it skewed geographically? Is it skewed demographically? Is it something that we can really use to uh, be a part of decision making at the city or not? We'll have evaluation questions that will help us answer that. We'll do it through a series of uh, surveys and focus groups and also some analysis of the media, including the social and traditional media venues around what is occurring in this conversation about city services. Here are our timelines. We propose that in April, May and June, we're preparing for a launch of this initiative in mid to late June. The launch would involve where our communication materials and the beginning of our education and uh, awareness building of the project. Over the summer months, we're going to be engaging with some of our staff, putting the logistics together for our fall events and orienting those that are going to be involved. The students, as I mentioned, will be out in our community at a variety of events and a variety of places, encouraging people to think about getting involved in the fall in whichever way makes sense for them. And then in September, October, and November, we are out in the community, implementing our face-to-face -face engagement with the public. We'd then be managing and analyzing the data and developing our reporting mechanisms. It is our uh, goal to be back in front of the senior management team and in front of, uh, of, of you through committee and council uh, in December. That would be late November and December uh, in terms of SMT and council. So I leave you with a bit of the role we hope you will play. So there's a bit of a request, although no recommendation. And that is that you support the plan and help encourage participation. Engagement only works if lots of people want to get connected and you can be a huge help for that. We also need help in connecting with your ward. We need to know how is best to communicate what we're trying to accomplish as a city through your individual channels. You all have, uh, have, have ways of connecting with the, the individuals that you represent, and we need to understand how to best work with those who are in your ward. We are at your disposal. We are training people that are prepared to come and help facilitate conversations and ensure that people can participate in a meaningful way in this exercise. We just need to know how to best do that. We will be reaching out to you, and we hope when we do that, that you'll be able to uh, provide us with very specific ways that we can be helpful for you in this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Paul. Mayor. Um, Councilor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Paul. I just, um, you mentioned students. Can I ask what age bracket or what are we looking at? High school, university, college? We are looking at uh, post-secondary, so college and university students for this exercise. Given what they will be doing, we felt that that was the age range that we would focus on. Because it's going to be imperative to capture the interest of those students before, well, they're almost finished now. Uh, going forward. So do we anticipate that we'll be able to capture and, and, and get some quality um, interested bodies? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, we've had some informal conversations without talking about the specifics and our understanding is because we wouldn't be hiring them in a part-time or full-time capacity, there's lots of interest in this. It's a high-profile project that will be able to uh, help uh, students build skills and also build a resume. So the information that we have back right now is, yes, we'll have a very talented pool of people to draw on. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. 
And Paul, I, I just want to thank you, Chris, and, and the whole staff team for, for turning this around. Uh, I'm feeling uh, very comfortable with the approach that you're suggesting here. And, uh, you know, uh, remembering and recognizing the challenges that we had with the, uh, the first time around, I, I think the important thing for any organization, uh, uh, including municipalities, perhaps especially municipalities, is to recognize when we maybe did a, a bit of a, a misstep and uh, to, uh, to take then uh, a step backwards uh, to begin with to, uh, to examine uh, where we were and, and what, uh, what occurred during that period of time and then be prepared, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to, to move forward uh, with, with a well thought out uh, grassroots, I'll call it grassroots in terms of the staff involvement and, and the internal in-house uh, approach that we're taking here uh, where, the, where the learnings from, uh, from the process uh, which is one of the benefits we talked about the first time around is, is learning about uh, public participation, what, what works the, the best uh, for Hamilton. Uh, those learnings are, are still going to occur and we're still going to be able to build those into uh, what we learned this year in this project and then in, in, uh, in, in years and decades to come and how we do uh, public consultation here in the city of Hamilton. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, it becomes a made in Hamilton uh, solution. We uh, uh, and we, we talked, uh, I think probably when we first talked about this a uh, year or more ago, uh, we talked about the importance of involving councillors. And I really like to thank you, Paul, for identifying that, your last slide there. Because uh, we, uh, looking around this room uh, and folks that are not here today, uh, there's a lot of expertise in public consultation uh, at the councillor level. Uh, we do it uh, every day, I guess, in terms of the regular interactions with phone calls and emails. but. But uh, boy, a couple times a week at uh, our own public meetings that we hold, and uh, we know what works and what doesn't work, and we have ways to communicate with our uh, our citizens in, in the different wards. So I think uh, put, uh, mapping out a, a large role for councillors, I think, is is is, uh, is the way to go. And I was very happy to see that uh, uh, as as, uh, as as one of your slides uh, today here, Paul. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll just close in saying I'm uh, extremely confident and uh, supportive and, and uh, happy with the approach that uh, Paul and, and the team has uh, put together coming out of our, our difficult uh, experience. But again, learning from, from what occurred and uh, pulling a positive out of what was a, a difficult situation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Paul, uh, Mike Kerkopoulos, John Murray, and your whole team. Uh, thanks for the revised plan of action for civic engagement, Paul. One quick question, uh, and forgive me for being a tiny bit of a nervous Nelly. I thought I heard you say somewhere along the way you will still be needing external uh, help or consultation, whatever. And so, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Paul, uh, how do you control that? And secondly, will, will you, versus the Dialogue Partners uh, experience, Will you or someone internally be quarterbacking it throughout? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please, to Paul. Paul. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. In terms of, of accountability, we have a, a very strong structure in how things uh, work. We have the teams that are looking at various aspects of this project, coordinated through Angela Parle and then through to me. So in terms of the, the coordination effort of it, uh, we feel very strongly about uh, the way that works. We will have to hire some external capacity in terms of facilitation of these conversations for the simple fact that in not all circumstances is it, very, is it best for city staff to stand up and lead a conversation about city services. Uh, those uh, uh, investments in the community will go to, to firms that have good experience with that and in terms of this work we have lots uh, I think that will be interested in this work I hope will be interested in this work in this community they will be working under the uh, un under the approach and the kinds of questions that uh, we have developed as a team so the work that they are doing is really to facilitate the conversation to use the materials that we have developed and that we have uh, uh, feel good about and have vetted through a number of processes and then placing those in front of the the, the uh, external contractors that we'll be working with and saying it's your role now to make sure that we have a good solid conversation and as I say we have as a as a corporation used uh, lots of those resources in the past to help us facilitate particular meetings be they controversial issues or large-scale initiatives and uh, so I feel confident again that uh, the response to our recall for per, for quotations on this will yield some good results but internally the controls on this uh, uh, will be very very strong. So, Paul, I appreciate that elaborate answer. Let me just ask, ask you very bluntly, whereas I, my interpretation was through Dialogue Partners, 
staff, if you will, um, after setting up the structure, handed it off. That won't be the case this time. There'll always be some measure of oversight and control from staff, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Paul. Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely, yes. Terrific, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jones, you take a chair for one second. Just two quick questions, Paul. Number one, I just want to reconfirm it in public. No new money. This is all going to be done within the existing budget, correct? Uh, through the chair, yes. Uh, it's all through the existing budget. Okay, and secondly, I think one of the, the main reasons the program got in trouble last time is because some, some character out there decided to hack into the website and put some material on there that may not have been appropriate. And, and uh, uh, what comfort can you give committee that uh, you're going to have enough firewalls in place to prevent hackers from going in? And Because clearly, if uh, once burned, twice learned, and, and you know, if we're going back out with this program, we have to expect somebody's going to try that again. Uh, through the chair, we're hosting this internally. It's going to be part of the city's website structure. It was not the last time. Uh, we feel very confident in the way that the city runs its website. It will simply be a page uh, on, on hamilton.ca, much like if you recall the web page that was there for the Citizens Forum on area rating of, of taxes. So uh, no one can guarantee 100% uh, that, that that won't happen. I think the risk of that is, is, uh, is uh, very, very low, or else our IS folks would have provided me with some of that, uh, that, that feedback. So we feel comfortable that the security people pieces are in place for this. You've alerted them that there is some skillful people out there who got in last time and, and uh, so they know that we can might want to expect it this time again? Uh, through the chair, uh, they experience these things all the time so uh, I, there are confidences with them but we will ensure that we've done everything we can. Thanks Paul. I'll take the chair back and see no more speakers. I'll call for a motion to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor McCaddy. No. <laughs> That's okay. I, no. I, I take that as a friendly note because I did tell uh, Lori that I didn't have a lot no of questions. He promised me no more questions today, so I'm going to um, hold him to it. No more questions. Uh, I, I um, and I think Councillor McCaddy did this as well. Uh, I'm not sure about the use of the tool, but we got local. Uh, we talked about this before. Local uh, operators in, in the community that did great work, and uh, I've been utilizing on the licensing um, rental licensing uh, issue. Uh, Dem Dem uh, I think it, it's democratize. called democratize. Sorry, democratize. And 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 I can see how that tool could be ado adopted in regards to uh, uh, engagement, service levels, and so forth, because it really allows. Because uh, I got it on my website now, and it allows people to go in, and if the wrong right question is not being asked, or other questions should be, or points should, should be made, they can actually incorporate that into the uh, uh, into the um, the, the survey, mm. and uh, and I found that helpful because then you get rankings on that. For example, I know which of the top uh, questions based on who's participating in the poll, which they obviously see as uh, significant issues. So uh, I just want to highlight that uh, in this process that we look at some of the tools that are out there within our own community and and leverage those opportunities as well. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, just so that uh, uh, the public and, and the councillors in, in attendance are aware, we did have some meetings with, with groups, including the, that tool and others who, who felt there were tools, never to the point of saying, yes, we'll, we're going to use your tool, but we wanted to hear what was out there. There was an awful lot of advice and support brought forward for here's how we can help in the future, uh, depending on what happens. So uh, we're aware of some of the tools that are out there, that one in particular that you've utilized, and I believe Councillor uh, McCaddy's also utilized and some others that are out there. However best we can fit in what locally has worked, we will. Uh, but I also want to state publicly that, uh, uh, of course, there's no way that we can involve all of the groups in Hamilton that would like to, to be involved in this. Uh, there just isn't either, either the resources or the need for that. And not all tools can, we be, can, we, can be used to, to develop our outcomes. But I appreciate that comment, and we'll look at the tool in particular. I, I think the, the, the point... The other point I'm making, though, is that uh, when you're looking at engagement, uh, you need to take a look at what, what, what we already have and how we can enhance it and utilize that. So I'm, I'm talking about the fact that I'm utilizing a website to do some of the very things that you're talking about, and many councillors have websites as well. So uh, uh, when you're looking at uh, the implementation of this program, I would hope that, uh, that you look at every tool that uh, allows participation of the broader community and utilize uh, that resource. Absolutely. Okay.
Okay, motion, uh, do you want to move it, Councillor Whitehead? Okay, and seconded by Councillor Morelli. Discussion on uh, receiving the presentation, all in favor? Carried. And a motion to receive the report. Moved by Collins, seconded by Morelli, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Discussion items. And Councillor Whitehead, you can no longer accuse me of not moving the meeting along fast enough. Um, members of committee, are there any questions with respect to item 8.1? Moved by Eric. Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, appropriate staff that's here that's here that could just um, give me an answer. If you recall, I think this uh, emanated from earlier in the budget session. If I recall, I think uh, Kathy Druitt from downtown BIA and staff were presenting, and as you saw, see here on the front page, uh, the four items there. Uh, Roman, a Roman numeral one was the one that I was concerned about that that um, that that would be available to any BIA across our city, the exemption from special event park rental fees. Um, the others, any community group can apply for the grants. Any, the Gore Master Plan obviously is exclusive to downtown um, and placement elements are more exclusive to uh, downtown. But number one was one that I had some concerns on behalf of Concession BIA with Councillor Duvall and I to ensure that they would as well be available for any exemption of fees. So through you two, the appropriate staff. That would it be Glenn? Or, uh, no? Who's the appropriate staff? Is it Neil? Neil, could you help me with that, please? Okay. Um, through you, Mr. Deputy Chair, yes, uh, we would be opposed to uh, exemption of uh, BIAs to special event rental fees. That could uh, have implications across the entire corporation. So, so my point was, Neil, are you telling me then that any are, any can apply for that kind of exemption? Because I think when Kathy Drew had put it up, it was for downtown and a number of us, our bells went off saying, hold it, would that be available across the spectrum? And that's the answer I'm looking for, Neil. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Neil. Just a moment, Councillor. Yes. Anna. Yes. Through the chair. So it was a request that was put through to the down, from the downtown BIA, and it would have to be the only people that can um, waive the fees for park rental would be council. So we did take your question before into consideration. You'll see at the back of the report that we looked at all the other BIAs and whether they were in parks or are on streets doing events, what that would look like in terms of cost. So yes, they would have the right to ask for that same consideration and it would be a council decision. Thank you, Anna. That's all I was asking, that they would qualify as well for that. It wasn't just exclusive to the downtown. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, just on that point, so just to qualify, does that mean that with this report that the downtown will automatically be exempt, but all other BIAs will have to apply? Could you just clarify that, please? Yeah. Through the Chair for clarification. This is just an information report, so it would then go back to council if they wanted to waive the downtown BIA uh, park fees. Any other BIA that has similar fees, whether in the park or on the street, would again have to go to council, request that consideration for waiving um, those fees. So it's only up to council that can waive those fees. This is just an information report, so there's no decisions in it. Right, and I, and I get that, but through you, Chair. So when the report comes to council with the recommendations, um, is, is that what I'm hearing? There will be a report coming back with the recommendation for the downtown BIA to be exempt? Uh, through the Chair, that would be a decision of council for you to direct us at this point to come back with a report on that. All right, thank you. I, I appreciate that because I'd certainly be on side, but it would need to apply for to all BIAs across the board, not just for one to be exempt and the others to apply. It would need to uh, apply to everyone. And uh, through you, Chair, if I could, on page six of seven, um, at, uh, at lunchtime today, I, I was at the uh, birthday party for Ernie Weeks. He's 102 years of age and the celebration is partly by the BIA, so I had a chance to speak with them. And they asked me to bring forward a committee that on page six of seven, where it does list the BIA events that are incurring parking charges, um, and the list there, that Waterdown BIA does have an event called the Candle and Coral Walk. They have not put in their seat application. And, and Anna, I just want to make sure that that's on the radar through you staff. It isn't until uh, December, the first Saturday in December, 
is when it happens. The first one was last year. We had over 500 people. Um, it's a choral walk throughout the downtown residential core, singing carols, carrying candles. And we just, there will be an application put forward for street closures. So I just want to make sure that that's on everybody's radar through you, Chair. Anna? Through the Chair, again, if we want to look at all of these issues, what I would need is that Council direct staff to come back with a report with all the BIA events, the costs associated with them, with a recommendation in that report then. And we will include that event in there also. Okay, and I understand that my point was, is just there are others in here on this report. It does not include the Water Down BIA. So that would be, I would want that added in. Uh, not just for the consideration, but it, it's missing out of, out of the report. Thank you, those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Morelli. You okay, or look. I'm fine. Councillor Whitehead. Just uh, one, uh, I have uh, some active neighborhoods that, uh, for example, I got uh, Gordy Park. Uh, they're having a movie night, they have Pumpkin Fest, they have Winter Fest, they have a lot of activities. You have Gilkson. Um, these are volunteers. Uh, they have very limited means in regards to revenue. They don't have full-time paid staff. And the issue has always been when they hold, hold these events that are a real positive event in regards to providing quality of life within neighborhoods, empowerment, and cohesion. Are they becoming second rate in the context of this consideration? Uh, are they part of the overall consideration corporately? Uh, I, just, I guess my concern is, and I'm a big supporter of the BIAs, but just focus on this rental fee waiving specific for one organization when uh, we just had a great presentation, uh, or will be, on regards to develop community and neighborhood development. One of the greatest tools is, uh, for example, in Gorley, they, they want to bring all the city services so we can introduce and educate and promote city services at their movie night, and yet we're going to charge them for the park rental. And I'm just thinking there's a better benefit corporately, corporately for those kinds of activities, yet we're looking at BIAs that have paid staff and have a way to levy where, where, where these neighborhood organizations do not. So please help, help me understand um, how they're going to be treated if we're providing some light on these exemptions for BIAs. The Chair, so park rentals are part of the um, user-free bylaw. So the only time that we can waive a fee would be through council. So if we bring, our, if staff are directed to bring forward a report around downtown BIA and then include other BIAs, then we would need direction from council on what else they wanted us to look at. We can bring that information forward so that you can see what the fees are, how much they um, are generating in revenues, et cetera. Okay, well, um, I certainly uh, support the intent here. I, I think the issue is you don't leave, when you're dealing with uh, exemption of fees, um, I find it completely unfair to focus on one organization when there's a broader implications and uh, when you look at our corporate strategic plan about engagement, that you're, you're, you're leaving um, those other aspects out of the, the, uh, the report. So I'm not sure where to go. I support what's in front of us. It's just an information report. I understand that. Um, you know, I'll work offline. Maybe I'll need a motion to maybe provide some focus on those kind of activities in neighborhoods and work with Paul Johnson on that. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Anna. I really appreciate where you're coming from. You've got policies you have to follow, and when you don't, it's on you. And I'm, I'm thinking right immediately of the Easter egg hunts. You know, there was a policy in place. We want to rent out these parks. It's all volunteers that want to do it. It got to the point where I finally just took out my checkbook and I paid for, and we sorted it out at the end of the day. So we know we're going through a CPP review. When I read this, my first thought was, why wasn't this taken and put into under that same umbrella so that we're not doing these one-offs? It says right in the report that last year they applied for 12,500 and got the amount for 3,000 because CPP policy, that's what, that's what they got. Uh, this year that they were applying for uh, similar, note 13.5, but again, Chances are, if it went through the, the normal CPP program, they'd only be allotted 3,000 again. So when I look at this, I look at one-offs all the time, and it just sort of gets me like this, because at the end of the day, we have so many organizations, as you all know, 
that that want to use our parks. They want to. They want road closures. They need police presence. Whatever the whatever the the list is to make it a successful event. But the CPP program, as we all recognized, is needs some tweaking, serious tweaking. So, is it fair to say that this is something that should also go underneath that review? Review, rather taking one out and always just reporting on that one thing to make more work for you? No. Through the chair, we, we do have the application process. It does go through the subcommittee, which is made of councillors. Um, for us, we, we do the same process regardless if they come forward and have a one-off. So when there are one-offs, it does land on the council floor and it is dealt with at that point. But it is it does circumvent the, the entire process and we are getting um, experiencing more and more of these. Thank you, Anna, for that. And through you, Deputy Mayor, you know, I'm, I'm all for any kind of event that brings a neighborhood or a community together. I'm for any event that promotes volunteerism. Uh, and, and it showcases even our businesses, our, our organizations. But I, I come back to what I argued a month ago here when, when my fellow counselor came forward with, with a one-off request and I still have that same consistent thought in the back of my mind. We need a review, it has to be addressed. Doing these one-offs, does that just put a monkey wrench into that review because now we're, we're making staff focus in another direction. And I still want to say is that we need to go back to the CPP process, go through it, and so when you are coming forward, you're coming forward with the policy to back you up. And then you can do it with all good conscience and your report will reflect, will reflect that. So I don't know what it is that you're asking here. Is this just information report? Then I would like to also refer this back to the CPP review as well so it gets captured along with all the other concerns that we have. Thank you. Okay, so I have no other speakers, so uh, I, my uh, roadmap says I need a motion to receive it. Um, you want to move that, Brenda? Director, my Councillor Pearson, all in favor? Carried. Carried. Uh, anything else on that? Did you? And to direct it to the, uh, the appropriate staff for the CPP review. So please. you're asking this to get referred to the, the Grants Committee then? Yes, please. For a review of this? As part of the review of the CPP. I'm seeing Anna shaking her head, so it sounds like it's a plan. Okay, all in favor of that, uh, just thank you. Members of the committee, are there any questions with respect to item 8.2? This is a capital project status and closing reports. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and through you on uh, Appendix B of the report. The um, shows the three three accounts for the courthouse and they're under the capital project closing list which page four six but my question would be yeah I said four six <laughs> um, there's three accounts listed under corporate facility and I'm just curious to know what the status is of those. Are they actually being closed and rolled up? I, I didn't see them in part A of the report. And I thought that was the, um, the recommended closure list. Mike? Oh, yeah, Martin? Fine. Sure. Yeah. Hey. Bernie, you going to take that? Hi, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, those items are going back into the reserve fund because there were so many separate accounts um, and various work taking place. It was both difficult to track and difficult to complete that work. So those funds will just go back into the reserve and when decisions are made related to the courthouse, we'll decide on the course of action. Mr. Collins? What, what reserve do they go back into? There's the, the courthouse reserve. Okay. All right, so all of these in this category, uh, uh, in this part of B, are going back into some kind of a dedicated reserve. Is that, is that what I'm to take from the whole for, list here then? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, with respect to Appendix B, uh, those projects are being closed and where they were funded from a reserve or some dedicated revenues uh, as per our policy, the uh, available funding would go back to the source of the funding, whether it's a reserve or from uh, another 
external funding source. So the roads, the roads projects would go where? Into an unallocated one or into a roads reserve? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I would assume through the roads, bridges, and traffic capital reserve. Okay. And, and, and through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just to the roads ones you'll see uh, on page two of eight, in fact, in, with respect to uh, a number of projects which uh, where the expenditures exceed revenues, uh, again, the shortfall is funded from the roads, bridges, and traffic capital reserve. It's the uh, first line item uh, in the table on page two of eight. Page okay. two of eight? Yep. That's okay. appendix B. I got that. Thank you. So if I could um, then turn your attention to, thanks for those, those answers, App appendix B, uh, sorry, D. And I'm looking at uh, page, the first inquiry is page 2 of 21. It's uh, about five projects down on the list. It's the road resurfacing program for 2011. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, there's $8.4 million worth of work that we would have allocated for a bulk of road resurfacing projects in 11. And there's... Um, 14% is complete. We have commitments, uh, more commitments for uh, on top of the actual expenditures of 200,000. So it's, there's an available balance of 7.2 million. And I'm wondering now that we're almost into the second quarter of 2013, how we have that sort of gap between it's budgeted in 11, we're all clamoring for more road and sidewalk work, and we have a essentially almost a two-year-old account that has the majority of the funds um, you know, that have, have not been expended. Are you on appendix E as in Edward? D. As in Donald? Yes, sir. What page? Two of 21, and it's the fifth project down. These are the open accounts. highlighted that one there are a number of them like that but I highlight that one because it's it's one of the largest on the page and and again it's one of those accounts that through the budget process we've all there, there are longer lists of requests to do uh, some road reconstruction than there are funds to to repair them and so I, I'm curious to know how we end up up in that situation after two years is there someone that can give me a, a brief understanding Jerry so through the chair, the projects um, are having started. One of the major ones for this is the Queen Street access, the Beckett Mountain access um, that we're, t we're doing in 2013. Um, so the money spent would, would have been on part of the design at the time. There's also uh, industrial drive has to be done as well. So there is projects allocated for that um, outstanding 7.2. We can provide a specific list for it. We haven't um, got the tender with it yet, but it was projects that were approved in the 2011 budget that will be uh, brought forward this year. And it's taking two years to get through the design on these larger projects. Is that a, a safe statement to make through you, Mr. Chairman? Through the chair, that's correct. There's one. In, generally, we're only a year lag. Um, I know these projects with the um, the relocates it take, it's taken longer than we anticipated on some of them uh, I can get the specific reasons uh, for it but the money is all going to the road infrastructure okay on the same list if I could uh, turn your attention to the green car program we unrolled that program in 2005 this may be a, a future fund funding source, I'm not certain, but if memory serves me right, we borrowed from the fund. It was $17 million in, in 05, and that was to roll out the program to the single family residential, then we did the multi-residential uh, developments, and I think the, the plan was to eventually get to the commercial sector, and there's still $1.5 million remaining in, in that fund. Will that... Um, cover the commercial rollout? Are we still planning to go ahead with the commercial rollout? Or 
are we close to a point in time where we can close this fund and and um, memory serves me right again if, if we were borrowing from the future fund then certainly there the payments then would would reflect the lower um, borrow through you sure. for the chair this is um, the, the issue with this one is again our multi res diversion we've had a significant um, uh, not a problem but a uh, conversion requirement with the uh, the multi res facilities so again we're reporting back on that uh, at the end of the year as per the the report we brought forward earlier to public works but this is the um, the funding for that uh, program as we roll it out but again, it, you know, it is, uh, as Councillor Collins indicated, for the f it's from the future fund. Any money we don't use for that will be uh, would go back. But we do need the money for the multi-res. And uh, again, we put additional resources on that to try and get the, uh, uh, you know, the those high-rise units, uh, multiple units, to uh, participate in the program. Okay. So I w okay. I, th I thought the fund was to roll out. To, to actually put the green carts in the buildings and then certainly our staff pick it up operationally afterwards. So they've been paid for and, and we have those green carts in all buildings. Are, are then we left with the assumption then that whatever issues or um, policy decisions we make that try to help people get on the system, put it that way, the funds required to do that will come out of this reserve? Sure. Through the, the chair, I'm 99% Sure, that's that's what we're doing. I can get a more a better update from staff on the multi-res and the other court, the commercial rollout. Okay. And uh, two last questions. One is the uh, Parkway accounts. Um, we still have those open from uh, the year 2000, and we're now in 213. Uh, are are we waiting for the whole process to wrap up with the federal government? We, you know, Mr. Chairman, we have that um, outstanding civil litigation with them. Um, and I, I don't want to get into legalities, but is there an operational reason why these accounts are still open and they're separated? And, and just as staff had mentioned earlier with the courthouse, I thought I heard the answer was it's kind of, um, it's difficult to manage all these open accounts. Is, is there no way then to um, either deposit the, the remaining dollars into a reserve or if, um, if we're short funds, and I'm trying to read here where we're at, globally, we may just be on budget. I think it says 100% here. Can we not just close these and start a separate file with the federal government just to take them off the books knowing that they've been on that long? Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of our existing practice around closing our capital projects, uh, corporate services staff consult with the department. If there are still any outstanding issues, whether it's a outstanding invoice, whether it is a uh, outstanding legal issue, we leave the projects open. Our practice has been to leave the projects op open until all those issues have been resolved, and then we come forward with a uh, with a recommendation to close the project. So even though we're looking for a reimbursement, we'd keep these open, knowing that there are no more expenditures to occur. Are legal fees paid out of that? Sure. So through the chair, there's two issues. Mike just referred to the legal. There's still we still have the ongoing monitoring uh, of the uh, the project, and that accounts used for that as well. So it's the two issues for the project. Okay. Thanks for that. My last question is the uh, farmers market. We've wrapped up that project. It's complete as it was designed. And if you'll notice on the same page, it's page. Uh, 11 of 21, we're, uh, we're $120,000 over budget, and it says here next to it, exterior sign for the market design underway. Wouldn't that, I'm assuming that there's a new sign that's coming to, uh, to York Street, wouldn't that necessitate a resubmission, understanding that we've already completed the original design? Or am I reading that wrong? Jerry, do you want to take that or Mike? Page 11 of 21. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the farmer's market being under community services. I'm sorry, Councillor Collins, I can't answer that question. I know that we're ordering and have underway the development of a new exterior sign. Oh, Marnie can answer it. Okay, hey, Marnie, sorry. you got, a, you got the magic answer. bullet here? Thank you. 
through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, that item was outstanding because there was going to be a sign put up. So the remaining funds were to go to only the portion of the design of it. So if it proceed, well, feasibility and design. So if it were to proceed, it would go to the 2014 capital request. However, that item will be closed in quarter one. And what's what's the cost? Thank you for that. And what's or the cost quarter two. Of, of the uh, sign? What's the cost the of the sign? The feasibility portion was fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. And and the sign itself is that something that's more elaborate? That will come out of the feasibility, and it would be, and it would have to be an ask for twenty fourteen. Okay. Those are my questions. Thanks, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I don't have any other questions on it, so I need a motion to approve the report. Councillor Partridge, you moving it? Don't Here sound little. so enthusiastic, Mr. Chair. <laughs> just just want to stay away yeah, from any criticism, and yeah, I'm moving I the meeting know. along fast enough. Keep smiling, keep <laughs> smiling. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one question, and it is on um, Appendix B, page two of six, and it's with regards to uh, Council Priority Project Rapid Transit. And it had $2,250,000 was a budget that was approved, but it says through you, Chair, that it's cancelled as provincial subsidy funding was not received. So my question through you, was the $2,250,000 the full amount of the subsidy funding or was there a portion of that? And, and I'm just wondering when that was cancelled. Uh, Thank you. So through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, when the original capital project was submitted to Council, the- Sorry, uh, Mike, I can't hear you. Sure. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with the uh, rapid transit project property acquisition was submitted in 2011 to Council. It was submitted uh, with a budget of two and a quarter million dollars with a uh, assumed external financing source being the province for the equivalent two and a quarter million dollars. Staff have been tracking uh, the, the outstanding funding equipment or uh, funding assumption with respect to uh, provincial funding. As we never realized that provincial subsidy, we're recommending at this time to close the project. There's been no activity on the project and staff have been uh, diligent in, in not pursuing any acquisition until such time as there was a commitment from the province with respect to funding. So again, it was approved in 2011. We had assumed, staff had assumed, that it would be eligible from, for funding from the province. Uh, we never realized the commitment with respect to land acquisitions, and it's appropriate to close the project given that there's been no commitment. Okay, thank you. Um so, but my question is, were we supposed to receive that funding and it just never happened? Did we get notification that it was canceled? Or was it always the intent that we would pay for it and that our commitment was the 2250000 For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, there was no commitment with respect to two and a quarter million at, uh, at the time of the 2011 budget, it was submitted. Uh, for consideration by council with this assumption that it may be eligible for funding. And okay. given that it was only possibly eligible for funding, again, uh, staff were diligent in not pursuing any land acquisition and charging any funds against this project until such time as we receive funding. Given that we haven't received any commitment from the province, we're recommending at this time to close out the capital project. If there is a future commitment, we would come forward with a future capital project. All right, Mike, thank you. I heard that full explanation without any interruption, so I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, Mike, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Mike, uh, the last two years we've been parking the Winona Seniors expansion, and that was on the res as the results of the Winona feasibility study came through. I don't see that here. Have we parked it somewhere else? Through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it continues to be a part project. It's funded from principally, I believe, 90% from development. Development charges. charges. And it, uh, Jerry's just confirmed it is an active project. Thank you very much. Okay, I see no more uh, questions. Uh, Councillor McKenna, are you moving it? Move it be approved. Yes. Seconded by Councillor Morelli. 
And uh, further discussion on it? Carried. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Um, item 8.3, tax rate operating budget variance report to December 31st. Councillor Jackson. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to uh, Mike. Um, so Mike, uh, you told us in the budget that uh, I think you said there was about a $3.4 million operational surplus uh, wrapped up from last year and it would be a disbursement of those funds. You bring back a report this month. Uh, is this uh, recommendation from that? And secondly, that's question one. Secondly, in the A part, you're recommending 915,000 go to the Best Start uh, Reserve to help the Best Start Child Care Program, subsidy program. Uh, was that the only program that was considered for the $915,000 surplus or were there areas of public works and recreation or others that may have qualified? So two questions through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Mike? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, two parts to my answer. If I can draw your attention to page 2 of 15 uh, of the report, you'll see on the top of page 2 of 15 a table, and that table breaks down the disposition of the tax supported and rate supported uh, surpluses for 2012. So you'll see at the top of the table, in the case of the tax supported operations, there was a surplus, uh, unaudited surplus of $3.4 million. Uh, and you'll see just below that there are some programs, some self-supporting programs, HECFI and police who had deficits and you'll see 280,000 in the case of HECFI and uh, 286,000 in the case of police. Those deficits would be funded by uh, through the HECFI reserve and the police reserve. In the case of library there was a surplus uh, in library services and the surplus uh, is redirected to the library uh, reserve as it is, it is a self-supporting program and the library surplus was $1.2 million. Uh, if you work further through, you'll see that there are some further transfers uh, as it relates to AODA, uh, Ontario Summer Jobs, and council approved with respect to any surpluses over and above budget as it relates to Flamborough slots that those proceeds be directed to the Flamborough Capital Reserve. So see, you'll see 118,000 uh, being directed to the Flamborough Capital Reserve. Uh, and you'll see staff's recommendation that one-time costs related to the HECFI transition of $2.4 million be funded from the 2012 tax supported capital. Uh, surplus. That leaves approximately $163,000 that staff are recommending be directed to the tax stabilization reserve. In the case of the rate supported, the water and wastewater and storm, you'll see 2012 actuals. Uh, there's a surplus of approximately 12.2 million. Again, this is a self-supported program and the proceeds would go to the water, wastewater and storm reserves. As it relates to the best start, there was a unfavorable variance uh, in, with respect to childcare, and the recommendation is that that unfavorable variance be funded by a transfer from the best start reserve of $915,000. So Mike, the, the A part of the recommendation, that, wasn't, that was not part of the $3.4 million at the top of page two, correct? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the A part is not a transfer to that reserve. The A part is a transfer from the reserve to okay. mitigate the unfavorable variance with respect to childcare. Thank you very much. That's what I was trying to clarify, Mike, just in case that staff had made a professional recommendation to use some of that for that. I just want to see what the lineup was potentially that may have qualified, but that's not a transfer. And so I, I'm satisfied with this report. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I see no other speakers in this. I need a motion to approve it. I Moved by Jackson, seconded by Collins. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Move on now to 8.4. Members, community questions? Any questions regarding the uh, Hamilton Waterfront Trust? I think I hear some tinkling over here. Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if you just indulge me for a moment or two here. This matter procedurally, it's not even on your outstanding business list, members of committee. 
This matter was officially procedurally, Mr. Deputy Mayor, wrapped up last December when Rob Rossini wrote a report in November that went to a GIC in December uh, with information from the Waterfront Trust. This is about that whole GST, HST matter. And unfortunately at that time, Rob Rossini could only report on what the Waterfront Trust could report on because we were still waiting for information from CRA, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Canada Revenue Agency. So we weren't even obligated procedurally to come back. But on behalf of Councillor Farr and myself and our board, I didn't like the fact that Mr. Depp, there was still a lingering question or two to completely close the loop on this issue. And I know Mr. Deputy Mayor, you were always interested to close the loop on this issue. This report basically, and if uh, my colleagues look at page three of appendix A at the bottom, the, uh, the title post audit, and by the way, this was done now by our new accountant who's been in place for about a year at the Waterfront Trust, who's an instructor of a county at Mohawk College, outstanding man, he's authored this report. Um, if you see there on uh, second line under post audit, in his opinion, adequate records are now, underlying the word now, being kept, returns are being filed in accordance with required laws and regulations. In essence, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I did have a meeting, Mr. Deputy Mayor, you were gracious enough to allow me to bring the new accountant, meet with yourself, Acting GM Mike Zagarek, uh, Councillor Collins and myself to close this loop. In essence, unfortunately, the Waterfront Trust Boards of the past relied on who they thought was a good financial mind, but in essence, in my humble opinion, was basically a glorified bookkeeper. And now we've got a professional accountant who's got us underway so that those kind of missteps uh, will be definitely avoided and averted in the future. That's why I'm very proud of the fact that even though we weren't obligated to procedurally, I insisted through the Waterfront Trust Board on behalf of Councillor Farr and I, and through Mike Zagaric's staff working in close consultation with them to bring this further information report to close that loop. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor Jones, you take the chair for one second. I, did, I was one of the persons that questioned this. I've got a little bit of knowledge around business and input tax credits and HST remittances. So Councillor Jackson was very gracious. He set up a meeting with this new account who is very capable, uh, has the professional designation, and uh, it's pretty clear there was nothing on toward went on. It was an error. And uh, when you purchase something, you pay HST, but when the vendor who sold that to you purchased the product, he also pays HST, which he can take as an input tax credit in his remittance to Revenue Canada. This particular accountant took HST, or it was GST at the time, it wasn't HST, took GST items where we didn't collect, for example, there's no GST on labor back then, but he took an input tax credit for all the labor. And so he took too much of an input tax credit, Revenue Canada did an audit, called it, clawed it back. So what this means is that some of the financial statements filed prior to the problem years were, were not as favorable as we thought they were because this revenue was taken then. But of course, generally accepted accounting principles require you to, when you find these errors, you've got to correct it in one year and correct it all at once. And that's why you saw a $400,000 write-off. And it was simply an error. There is no money that went missing. Just they took money back from Revenue Canada that they shouldn't have and has now all been cleaned up. So I, I just want to thank Councillor Jackson for setting that meeting up. I know I have a clear conscience now. I was very concerned about it. And uh, so I think we're on the road to the, to the right path this thing. With that, I'll take the chair back. Thank you. Uh, the motion to receive the report. Seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor, carried. Okay, the meeting should move right along now. Uh, we got nine. We're good to go. <laughs> Members of the committee, are the questions questions with respect to item eight point five corporate service delivery review and selection opportunities for service delivery? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve its uh, recommendations. So Second by Collins. Discussion. Carried. All in favor? Carried. Members of the committee, item 8.6 is a report containing comments from the Seniors Advisory Committee with respect to the KPMG service delivery review opportunities for service delivery. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Councillor Morelli. Just a quick comment, I'll move the receipt, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I do want to just point out that the seniors, uh, on behalf of Tom Jackson and myself, have made a number of uh, productive comments, and I just want to point them out uh, in the report. Certainly, I, I guess this will be going to Paul Johnson's group, and, and uh, I think it's a, reflects a great offer by the seniors who have uh, 
put this together. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move receipt. Okay, well, you know, come back to you for that. Councillor uh, Pearson. Thank you. I'll second it also, Mr. Chairman and Deputy Mayor. And I, I too agree. And thank you uh, to the seniors that uh, contributed the information on here. And as I was reading the report, though, I noticed that uh, in item C, with regards to the suggestion of transit reducing evening and weekend services, not just it doesn't just affect the seniors. It affects a large number of our young people who have part-time jobs and trying to get around after school or even through the summertime. Um, so there's, there's more than just the seniors that get affected when we start looking at decisions like that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Johnson. Okay, move by Burley, seconded by Johnson that uh, uh, receives the report. All in favor, carry. Uh, members committee, item 8.4 is the Pan Am subcommittee uh, report. Are there any questions? Councilor Burley? I'm, I'm sorry? Is that the Pan Am one, right? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to just point out, uh, you would appreciate this as we uh, sit as co-chairs, but uh, I just hope that everyone will take a, a few minutes just to read this uh, very closely because there's a, a lot of new stuff that even you and I haven't seen in terms of this new designation program and, and, and the fact that we're going to establish an Iverwind Community Fund program and that's coming back in the future. So I just want to point that out to, uh, to the committee today that uh, it would be worthwhile looking through this. I have some further questions, but I can take those offline uh, with uh, uh, Coralie, you know, where you look at the municipal designation programs, the fact is uh, we want to be have a clearer picture in, in terms of how the engagement strategy is going to occur during the game period as well as uh, moving forward. So I just would uh, ask Council respectfully uh, to take a good close look at that. Even the uh, rural, um, the mural program that we're talking about and also the fact that we're working on uh, what's going to occur in terms of uh, uh, hosting the, uh, the 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 uh, actual games and the community engagement at that at that point as well. So I just want to make that, that those points, and I'll move receipt of the report as well. Okay, moved by Morelli, seconded by Councilor Marula. Just one other update is that um, Council has been assured that we won't uh, be um, signing any agreements with McMaster University for the practice facilities of the training camp until the lease is signed. I know uh, we all saw in the paper this morning where training camp is starting tomorrow. It's a junior camp and it's not funded by the city. It's still our, our resolve that we will not be signing any agreements with McMaster to fund the training camp until the lease uh, is signed with the tight cuts. Okay, there's a motion to uh, receive it. All in favor? Um, notice is a motion. Uh, Councillor McCaddy is not here to uh, to put it up. Um, is it before us, Madam Clerk? Do we have it? It's a notice of motion, which will be a motion in so the So no, no need for any movers? What, no, the, the he was going to leave doesn't it. have to be here? Okay, he so that's done. General information, members of committee, uh, item 11.1 .1 is a revised due date for an item on the outstanding business list. I have a motion to amend the, uh, the due date accordingly. Johnson, Pearson, all in favor? Very, very members of committee, are there any additional items of general information or other business? Okay, I think we need to, to go in camera now. No, no, we have an um, identifiable individual. Oh, Chris? Uh, to you, uh, Deputy Mayor, I, I'm just wondering, in light of the fact, I know you do have quorum, but the intent was to get as many members of, of council or committee in a room to have this conversation. So I, I don't, I mean, putting it off is, is um, not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. I, I, I was hearing from some of your colleagues who have left that they would like to be part of that, that conversation. Okay. So, um, Unfortunately, you're always at the end of the agenda. This is the second time we put this off. That would be great. Okay, come Madam Clerk, can we, now that would require us to go in camera right at the start of the meeting. Should we go, go in camera after we hear delegations because they'll all be here? Okay, can you take that as direction then, Madam Clerk, or do you need a motion to that effect? Is that okay? Okay, the next meeting I think is May 1st, isn't it? Probably. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Councillor uh, Tom. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through, to, through you to Chris uh, Murray. Uh, Chris, what about at, uh, since our five o'clock starts now, or two hours early, how about a council next Wednesday? Through you to Chris? Uh, so, so through you, Deputy Mayor, I'm looking at the clerk shaking her head, so I usually, nope. okay. but uh, you know, aside from uh, the next meeting of GIC, I think is May 1st, and we're, it's gonna be regarding the um, LRT uh, revenue uh, options. And so I suspect we'll probably have a, a full house for that, so. I, 
I would humbly suggest try between you and the clerk maybe for next Wednesday at council if it's not too heavy an agenda. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and Councillor Pearson. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Certainly I agree with that if that's possible. The only other is, I mean, there is a possibility on May 1st of we can go in camera and set the, the portion with presentations doesn't start till 10 a.m. Then they can be here, but we don't open the doors until 10. If that's, that's something to think about. Uh, through, through the chair, if you would leave it with me and I will see what, what sorts of arrangements um, we can make to accommodate the, pres the in camera portion. Okay. After the, after the delegation is in. So uh, before we lose quorum, can I have a motion to adjourn? Well, oh. Two minutes, in minutes, I'll move those. Okay, thank you. Good point. April 3rd, April 4th. I'll move Seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Carried. Now a motion to adjourn. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Carried. Good job, Mr. Good job. Good job.